Here's my encounter in the best details that I can remember. It happened to me in New York. I'm an avid outdoor enthusiast. I enjoy hiking, fishing, rock climbing, and just about anything you can enjoy while being outdoors. I was a Boy Scout, and then later on in life I took on the responsibility of teaching kids survival skills, so I'm very acclimated to the woods and all the creatures in them. But when you have an encounter like this, nothing, and I mean nothing, can prepare your mind to handle what I'm about to tell you. It was early summer and I was going on a solo fishing trip to spend one of the days of my weekend in my favorite spot. It was about a 45 minute hike up a beautiful mountain to this spot, and it's also not very well known. It's a gem of sorts. Only locals are aware of this area. I'd been out there for about three hours and caught one keeper and was having a really good day. I started to hear what I presumed was another person walking up behind me, and I thought it odd since I come here often, and I'm almost always the only one up here. But I thought, well, I'm not the only one here who knows that this spot exists. Nobody ever walked up through the path, though. I even yelled hello at one point, and then the walking sounded like it was coming from all around me, but still there was no answer. Just then, I heard a strange kind of growling sound, like a real strange mix of a baby crying and a deep dog growl. When I heard this, I was immediately uneasy. In all my years, I have never heard such a sound in the woods, or anywhere for that matter. All I had on me that day was a small knife and bear spray. I fumbled in my pocket for my knife, and behind me I started hearing heavy walking. So I go and I stand on this flat rock so I can see all around me, but still, nothing was showing itself. This made me even more uneasy. And then from behind a pine, about 60 feet, maybe more, I see what I can only describe to you as the most wicked looking animal that I have ever seen. This creature has what appeared to me at the time to be a hand with long claws around the tree bracing itself. This thing is slowly peering at me from behind the pine. My first thought was bear, but it just looked too canine to be a bear. I thought this because I guess at the time it's the only two things my mind could put together as to what I was seeing. It had pointy ears like a German Shepherd, and I literally saw twisting and turning as if these ears were listening very careful for something. It had medium black fur with some dark brown mixed in, and these massive muscles. It reminded me of those guys who run track. Just an absolutely massive size of muscle. I could feel my whole body trembling with fear. Now, I've encountered mountain lions and even bears and never once felt this kind of fear, but for some reason this thing that I was looking at terrified me. I moved my right hand up slightly. It was the hand that was holding my knife. Why I did this, I don't know. But when I did this, this thing started running towards me with the agility of an all-star athlete. In fact, its movement seemed almost fake. It ran kind of side to side and was wicked fast. The only thing I could think to do was yell at the top of my lungs while simultaneously waving my hands above my head. And this thing stopped on a dime, so close to me that I can now smell him, and it smells like body odor and wet dog. That smell was so strong, it made my eyes tear. This creature is huffing and beginning to show its teeth, not like a dog would, almost like it was grinning almost like it wanted me to make another move. I know it sounds crazy, but I almost felt like it was saying, yeah, come on and challenge me. And when I say grinning, I don't mean like a smile. I mean like the Joker's grin, but more evil, almost like there's a demonic side of this thing. I remember thinking to myself at that moment, what kind of animal can grin like that? Then it begins to walk in this semicircle in front of me back and forth and back and forth, bearing those teeth. And let me tell you, those things were as sharp as sharp can be. All the while, it's growling and grunting at me. I looked at its hands. They were bigger than my head. And as it walked, it sort of drew its fingers up into a fist and then released them. It did this a few times. Its hair looked matted in some spots, and in some spots it was longer and smooth, 
and I could actually see the muscles rippling underneath this thing's fur. These muscles were so big that I didn't think any animal or man could have them unless they were on roids. He would breathe in and out, and when the creature would exhale through its nose, it almost sounded like a horse. It's so close to me now that I could see bits of meat in its mouth hanging in between its teeth and leaves in its hair. It had a scar under one eye that almost looked infected, and the eyes looked black with a deep red or maroon tint to them. I can feel this thing's hatred for me radiating off of it, and I know how it sounds that I'm saying that, but it felt like hate was just emanating from this thing. The skin on its face was a deep dark gray, and the inner parts of his hands were the same color with some spots that were leathery and worn looking. The creature made me feel like an ant in its presence. It had to have been a good nine feet tall, and I know again that sounds massive and unbelievable, but I promise you I'm not exaggerating. It had feet that were also clawed, and at one point it almost seemed to balance itself on the balls of its feet. I just stood there in this unbearable fear. It gripped me and paralyzed me, and I'm embarrassed to say that I peed on myself. When this happened, the creature began to sniff the air wildly, walking back and forth. Finally, my brain caught up with me, and I did the only thing I could do. I ran. I know that you're not supposed to run when there's a predator around, but I couldn't help it. I left everything behind. My pole, my pack, my fish. I just ran. I ran so fast and so far for so long that my chest was burning. But I could still hear that creature running behind me. I could see him dodging in and out of the trees. And as it ran, it roared. And it roared so loud it made my chest vibrate and my ears hurt, but I kept running. I only looked back a few times to see how close it was. At one point, I remember not hearing anything behind me anymore and finally having the courage to stop. By then, I felt like my lungs were going to fall right out of my chest, that I was just going to fall over and die. I looked all around me, and directly behind me to my right, there he was. His chest was moving up and down, just as fast as mine. He was staring at me, and gave out one last roar. That was enough to make me start running again. I ran back in maybe 20 minutes. How I did that I'll never know. Pure fear and pure adrenaline probably. I remember vividly getting back in my car and having the overwhelming fear come over me that I left my keys behind in my pack and then relief when I felt them in my pocket. I hopped in my car, sped off and drove until I got home. I'm almost positive I ran multiple lights but can you blame me? Of course I didn't mean to, but you have to understand that I was so overcome with fear and shock, I wasn't thinking straight. And believe me, I never went back for my items. It was an expensive pull too, but I didn't care. I just couldn't bring myself to go back, and I didn't want to ask anyone to go with me either and risk them and myself again. I would never put anyone else in danger because of a stupid fishing pole. And why would I tell them that I left everything behind? No one could believe me. It's such an amazing tale. How could you? I've heard stories of Bigfoot and always chalked it up to people having fun telling campfire stories. I never heard of Dogman until I began to do some research after my own encounter. And I'm sharing this because I want to warn others to be aware of the dangers that are truly out there. I want people to know that it's real. I don't know where they come from, or how they came to be, but they are truly real, and people deserve to know. Especially people who have families and children who enjoy the outdoors. They should know they need to always be vigilant, always bring protection and be on guard. I'm not saying to live in fear, but just be aware. I'm finally able to go back into the woods again, but it's been years since that encounter. I hope I'd never see anything like that again. What would the odds be of seeing it a second time anyway? I definitely don't go up to that spot anymore. 
thank you for allowing me to share this. And just remember to stay safe out there. Let me start off by saying that what I'm about to type is something I've carried with me for the past 24 years, and I haven't really spoken much about it since I was a child, and I've never spoke about it on any kind of public forum such as this. You're free not to believe me. In fact, I encourage you to doubt anything that you're told from anyone. I'm typing this message because I've gotten older and I've spent over the last two decades developing a life to my best ability. I've carried an immense weight on my shoulders that neither therapists nor psychiatrists treat as anything other than a method of repressing memories at best and the delusions of a lunatic at worst. I don't blame you if you draw those same conclusions. I'm typing this in what I believe has become the most publicly traded speaking place on the internet for the sole purpose of attempting to drop the weight that I've carried and move on with my life. This is more of a personal cleanse than an attempt at intrigue. I will have at least gotten it off of my chest after I tell you this though. I'm not from here. And by here, I don't mean where I currently live. I mean where any of us live. Anyone listening to this right now, it's now a few days after my 30th birthday. And this time of year always strikes me because I started kindergarten on my birthday when I turned five. I thought at that time, everyone did that. You turn five and when you turn five, you go to school. I didn't realize my birthday just happened to coincide with the first day of school. And a little over one year later, in about two weeks time, it will been 24 years to the day that my entire world just vanished and I have no explanation to what happened. I was born in San Diego and I lived in a poor suburb of San Diego as a child. I lived at an apartment complex called Lemon Vine Apartments. They were a bit slummier than the versions of the Lemon Vine Apartments in Lemon Grove, which was another suburb in San Diego. My parents were divorced, but friendly. My mother was young when she had me, and she was beautiful. She was in her early 20s and was aspiring to be a model and would regularly take trips to LA to do photo shoots. She did glamour modeling for magazines. She had a darker skin tone, being one quarter Indian. An Indian, I mean, not Native American. So it gave her this exotic look that everybody liked to take pictures of for their magazines. My favorite picture of her as a child was her modeling this luxurious wedding dress for a bridal company. I used to sleep with that picture when she'd go to LA and I'd stay with my dad. My dad worked for the city of San Diego. They shared custody pretty evenly and we even did Christmas together as a family, even though they'd split when I was still a baby. My dad, his girlfriend, my mom, who was single, and me. Maybe things weren't as good between them as I remember, but I was six, so if there was drama, it was hidden behind the scenes, and they did a really good job of hiding it from me. On September 17th, 1996, I was staying with my dad's parents in Riverside, California. They had a small farm where they raised chickens, pigs, and goats. No horses or sheep or anything. But my grandma had several pet ducks that would eat seed from your hands, fly away, and return every year like clockwork. My dad had to work at night for a week, and my mom was in LA, so I was staying with my grandparents. Back then, schools were pretty cool with this kind of thing. I was just sent home with those sorts of nonsense assignments that you'd expect a first grader who'd just gone back to school after summer break to get. The 17th was the third day that I was staying with my grandparents and my grandma had told me to be careful outside because she'd seen a rattlesnake and wasn't sure where it went. So, since no one knew where the mystery snake had gotten off to, six-year-old me decided to go hunting for it. In hindsight, letting a six-year-old go around a farm with a rattlesnake was probably not in the Parenting 101 handbook, but it was the 90s and I guess they didn't actually expect me to find it. There were woods on the property, but I wasn't allowed to go in there, so they probably figured that's where the snake had gotten off to. I spent all day outside playing jungle exploration on the farm, trying to track down this rattlesnake, and much to my excitement, when I decided to open the well house, there the snake was, curled up and rattling away. I immediately slammed the door shut and ran to my grandparents' house to tell them that I'd found it. 
Now, this might be my six-year-old memory exaggerating, but I'm pretty sure that snake was at least 900 feet long, give or take a couple inches. I found it, though, and I was excited to tell my grandpa that I found the snake so he could, you know, do what he did and go out and shoot the thing. I ran to the back door of the house, which led into the laundry room through the kitchen. I paid no mind to anything until I turned left and entered the living room, expecting to see my grandparents, my uncle, and the neighbor couple all sat in the living room where I'd left them. Except, they weren't there. And it wasn't the same living room anymore. The furniture was completely wrong. The hard and memorably uncomfortable hardwood furniture that my grandpa loved so much was gone. The coffee table he made out of a tree stump was gone, replaced by fluffy grandma-looking furniture. A three-person sofa with a floral design on it. The TV was in the wrong place, and newer than my grandparents' old sit-around-the-cabinet TV. The hardwood paneling on the walls were gone, or at least covered by blue wallpaper. The hardwood floor was a shaggy off-white carpet. The pictures of my dad, my uncle, me, and my grandparents were gone from the walls replaced by paintings and pictures of people that I didn't recognize. As confused as I was by this, I was more confused by everybody missing. In my six-year-old brain, I'd accepted that maybe they have completely rearranged the house while I'd spent the day looking for a snake, but I didn't believe at all that they would all just leave me alone. And I didn't see anyone leave. I didn't see the cars go down the road. So I walked to the front door, which was attached to the living room and thought maybe they'd gone to the chickens or pigs. Both should have been visible from the front door, but even the chicken coop was gone, and the pig pen had lost its fencing, and there were no pigs to be found. At this point, I was beyond confused, and I was starting to get very scared. I didn't want to be alone. I didn't see anybody. Even though they lived on a small farm, the neighbors that had been visiting lived just across the dirt road, so... I ran down to our dirt driveway and across the road to their house, assuming that must be where everybody went. I remember getting more and more scared as I ran to their house, and I remember starting to cry when their house was the wrong color. It wasn't that faded yellow house that it used to be. It wasn't even the right house anymore. Nevertheless, though, I banged on the door. I remember that at this point I was crying quite profusely because I didn't understand what was happening and I kept wiping my face, which covered it in dirt after having been digging around under stumps and logs for snakes all day. When the door opened and a woman in her late 40s to early 50s answered, I'd never seen her before, so I just started bawling uncontrollably. Everything after this point is largely a blur because nothing was right. I knew where I lived. I knew where I went to school. I knew where my grandparents lived. But I met the people who lived where my grandparents used to. They were not my grandparents. I did not know them. I begged for them to get my uncle to tell them who I was, but my uncle wasn't there either. Through a series of various police and people in suits, I was brought back to town where I lived with my mom after spending what seemed like 10 hours at a local police station trying to contact my parents. I had my home phone number memorized, but I told them that my dad might be asleep. When they called that number, the person on the other end had no idea who I was, or what they were talking about. I was asked to give the police officers my address. I sat in the local police station while the police in my hometown went to my address. When they finally arrived back at the station, they informed me that the name of the apartment building was incorrect. Lemon Vine Apartments didn't exist, and the address I gave them was to an apartment complex called Merritt Manor. The apartment number I gave them was unoccupied. I believe at this point they were operating under the assumption that I'd given them the wrong information, the wrong apartment number, the wrong name of the apartment, and that I did in fact live there, but I just didn't know which apartment I lived in. When I was finally brought back to my hometown after changing hands a couple more times between police, I was asked to give the police officers my address again, and I was driven to where I lived. That was it. That was my apartment complex. But, like everything else, it looked wrong. It was painted a different color, and the sign that used to have a large image of a lemon reading Lemon Vine now read Merritt Manor. I took the police to exactly where I lived, just as they said I would, but there was nobody there. From this point forward, the police attempted to contact neighbors, all of whom knew me, 
but none of them were who they were supposed to be. Every person who came out of the apartment buildings around me were the wrong people. They didn't know me. From this point, they attempted to contact my father, which should have been easy, considering that he worked for the city, but no employee by his name apparently worked for the city in any capacity. Day turned into night. I spent hours sitting at the police station as they attempted to find any person in the entire world who knew me. I couldn't do anything but cry and cry and cry. I cried endlessly. A woman in a suit, who I think was either a detective or just someone who happened to work at the station, sat with me for several hours to try to keep me calm. She gave me a stuffed dog, a Dalmatian puppy that looked a little bit like the ones from 101 Dalmatians, and told me that his name was Sparky. She said that I could keep him, and that when we found my parents, Sparky could go home with me and make sure that I didn't get lost again. She said he was a good dog and that he'd protect me if I took care of him. During this time, they attempted to contact my school. When I told them I went to Shawnee Elementary, it was easy to find. It was really close to where I lived, but a school by no such name existed. My school was now called something like Anza Elementary. At one point, I was asked by the police if I'd ever had my fingerprints taken, which I had. In kindergarten, my entire class had our fingerprints taken by police at a school gym for basically this exact reason. But unsurprisingly, this didn't help at all. They couldn't find my parents, my grandparents, my neighbors, my apartment, and now they couldn't even find me. There was no record that I existed. I was too young to remember my social security number, but I severely doubt now that it wouldn't have mattered at the time anyway. They asked my birthday and any relevant information that could help them figure out who I was and where I belonged, but nothing I told them turned up any information about me. At some point, I was taken to the ER as the police suspected I may have had some kind of head injury or something, but after being looked over by a doctor, they found nothing wrong with me and I was sent back to the police station. I ended up staying with someone that night. I'm not entirely sure who it was. Someone from child services, I imagine. I couldn't stop crying long enough to really focus on what was happening after this point. I cried myself to sleep several times in the police station and cried myself to sleep again that night at that house, despite the woman who I was staying with trying everything in her power to calm me down and cheer me up. I clung to Sparky so hard I'm surprised I never popped his head off. I didn't have my picture of my mom, I didn't know what was going on, and no one could find out where I belonged. This didn't make sense to me. I was only six and just barely. I lived where I lived and my parents were my parents. My school was my school. They all disappeared in one day. In between fits of crying and waking up where I begged to go home, I begged the lady that I was staying with to try and call my dad again. I just kept begging to go home. I just wanted to see my dad again. Over the next few days, I was interrogated and questioned by different people at different times, at different places, all hours of the day. Police, investigators, people from departments I still don't know, child psychologists, it seemed like everyone under the sun was asking me questions. I was back and forth between the police station and the house that I was staying at, until eventually, Someone told me that they thought they'd located my parents and they were coming to get me. Finally, I was going home. Finally, this was over. Finally, I could get away from all these strange people asking me the same question over and over and just be with my dad. When the couple showed up at the police station, my heart fell into my feet. They weren't my parents. They'd had a son go missing around the same time, and I fit the description pretty closely. The woman started crying when she saw me because she immediately knew that I was not her missing son. But I was out of tears to cry at this point. Eventually, I was collected by child services and I was taken to a foster family where I stayed for a few months. The police launched a campaign asking for someone to come forward with any information about me. They took my picture at the police station for the newspapers to put in the news. I never let go of Sparky for a second. They didn't want me to hold him in the photo because I didn't have him when I arrived, but I needed him, and I would throw an immense tantrum when somebody tried to take him away from me. They even had me put back on the clothes that I was wearing when they found me, just so I'd look the same in the picture. 
In those months I spent at the foster home, parents of missing children would come to the house to see if I was their child. I didn't realize this was what was happening until I was older and looking back on it. They didn't just pull me out and say, hey, is this your kid? They were a bit more subtle about it. The parents would come to meet me, and upon realizing I was not their missing child, they'd often leave in tears. Looking back at all these families that came to see me in desperation that they were going to have their child back, I just feel so horrible for them. It's a feeling I can't really explain, like a type of guilt or something. Like I wish I had been their child so they could have them back and know they were safe. Most of these people probably never saw their children again, but I imagine that all of them were reunited, even though I know it isn't likely. This guilt is one of the things that kept me in therapy as an adult, but like I said, no therapist has ever bought my story or believed what I said. The most common belief suggested to me has always been that I was abandoned as a child or I lived in some abusive home and I was dumped on the side of a dirt road in the middle of farmland. They think I repressed all the negative memories that I had of my past, that I built up all these good memories just to cope with what I'd been through. I didn't stay at that foster home permanently. Eventually, while my case wasn't officially closed, I did need to start going to school again, but I needed identification. I was issued a birth certificate for the date that I told them was my birth year, but they put the day and month listed as September 17th, the day that I was quote unquote found. I never understood why they didn't just use the day and month of my actual birth, but I imagine it was because they didn't think I actually knew what my birthday was. My name was unchanged. I started going back to school sporadically. One of the child psychologists that was seeing me recommended I not be placed back into a full curriculum immediately and suspected that I was suffering from some sort of PTSD. I was put into these special classes and was only made to go to school twice a week initially. Eventually, though, I started going full-time and changed foster homes a few more times. I really can't say how much time passed before it happened, but eventually I was placed up for adoption. I was never actually told I was up for adoption, so I'm not sure how soon after I was found that this was. But eventually, people started coming to see me. But these people weren't looking for a missing child. They were looking to adopt one. But I definitely did not present myself as a good candidate. I had a story no one believed or could even verify. I insisted my parents would eventually find me and rarely had a day that I wasn't crying until my eyes burned. This story doesn't have a happy ending. I never saw my parents, my family, my friends, anybody ever again. I was a ward of the state until I turned 18 and went nowhere from there. My teens were filled with delinquency and I did a brief stint in a place similar to Juvenile Hall in San Diego. I never went to college, and I never really started getting my life together until I was around 24. I haven't talked publicly about this before until now. At least not since I was a child speaking to everyone who was trying to figure out where the hell it was that I came from. I still have Sparky. He's old and worn out now, still in one piece, but now he's a darker shade of gray through all the years of getting dirty. He sits on my dresser and is there, just like he's always been, as long as I've been here. While I haven't publicly brought this up or spoken about it in any large-scale fashion, I've told the story to people who wanted to listen, and I've gotten one question, understandably, repeatedly, every single time, including from my own shrink. So before you ask it, I'll try and answer it as best as I can. That question is what things are different in the place you came from compared to where you are now. But the answer is I'm not really sure. I was only six years old. Apart from my life that I knew with my mom and my dad and my grandparents and that farm, I didn't really know many other details. I was asked about countries, states, laws, planets, languages, you name it. Any proof that something was different where I came from. The continents could have been completely different for all I know. I wasn't particularly bright at that time. I mean, I was hunting for rattlesnakes, for God's sakes, and I also thought California was a country. I can say, though, that the President of the United States was not Bill Clinton. I can't remember exactly what his name was, but we learned it in kindergarten. I believe his name was Robert something, and I really want to say Robert Wilmer, but don't quote me on that. 
I doubt I'll ever get answers for what happened that day. It's been so long since I came over to here. Never once have I had any type of closure. Maybe somebody listening to this has a similar story where I honestly think maybe I shifted into a parallel world, but I don't know, and I don't think I ever will. Around 25 years ago, I was living in Boston. My friends and I would go to New Hampshire nearly every weekend as one of our group of friends had a family member with a cabin in North Conway in the White Mountains. I had made an acquaintance with an older man and later became friends with him, as we all did. He lived a few miles down the road from us. To preface this a bit, he had served in Vietnam in combat. He was one of the brightest, most intelligent, and intellectually engaging people that I've ever met. An all-around good person, and a man's man, as the saying goes. If the trauma of service in wartime affected him, I never saw any evidence of it. He had a laid-back, jovial demeanor, a quick wit. His attitude and outlook on life was every day is a very good day. Just an overall joy of a person to be around. I once asked him how he stayed in such a positive, upbeat mood. I was then 20 years old, and like everyone that age, I had what I thought were real problems and got into bad moods and stuff like that. He told me one night over a campfire, John, when I was over there in Vietnam, I went through a lot. I saw a lot. I did a lot. Hell. It was hell. I swore to myself that if I ever got back home and got out of that jungle, I would never have a bad day again. And I haven't. It worked for me. It was a great explanation. I never did forget those words. So as you can likely gather, he was a very level-headed, grounded, and intelligent man. Like many in rural New Hampshire and many in wooded areas around there, he always carried a handgun. Always. He carried two, I later found out. They were both identical Smith & Wesson Model 29 44 Magnum revolvers with short 3-inch barrels. Not a very common gun in that particular configuration, so I recall them specifically, even now. He loaded them with hand-loaded rounds. He had cast his own bullets of mostly silver. Yes, I said silver. He carried around silver bullets. Probably a great way to ruin the barrel quickly. He told me and a few of us in a very matter-of-fact tone to never go outside at night if possible. Never. Someone in our group kind of laughed it off and made a remark of some kind. That's when he got very serious. His jovial demeanor that I enjoyed so much was gone. He was very serious and said, Look, believe me or don't, I'm just trying to save your lives. There are things out here and they're not supposed to be. They shouldn't exist. Yet, they do. They're not bears. They're not deer. They're not anything that should be walking around, but they do just that. They walk around at night, and none of them have any regard for your lives. Hell, they see you as a food source. They're an apex predator, and they'll think nothing of killing you. So stay in the house at night. Then, he walked off. Needless to say, everybody there was extremely creeped out by his little outburst. We were used to him just being calm and collected and funny. This night was different, and he put everybody on edge. But then, the next time I saw him, he was his old self again. We talked a bit, and he told me then that he had seen what he believes were werewolves. Or at least... That was the closest thing he could ever compare them to. He said they were very large and very fast, and he believed very intelligent. Maybe even human-level intelligence. He also told me that's why he carried a heavily loaded forty-four Magnum, which for anywhere in New England is really overkill if you've ever been here. But he estimated their weight to be 450 to 500 pounds, their height to be 7 feet or more. He was six foot four and said they had a foot or more of height on him. He'd been within 20 yards of these things and said they tried to flank him. 
The main biggest one, which he thought was the Alpha, kept his attention, and the other two began what he called the classic flanking maneuver. He fired his gun into the ground as a warning, since he wasn't sure what he was dealing with and wasn't even sure that his gun would even be effective. He fired two rounds and then leveled his gun at the one facing him. He said it threw its arms and hands up in a reflective defense posture and then stared at the gun intently, as if he knew what it was and what it could do. It then made a loud noise and it and the others ran off into the woods. He believes that those noises, or grunts as he called them, were these creatures' way of communicating with each other, and that Alpha called off the attack because he didn't want any of his pack to get hurt. If you know anything about guns, you know a 44 Magnum is loud. A 44 Magnum with a 3-inch barrel is horrendously loud for reference. If this was a normal animal, just the sound of that gun should have scared it off. But he shot, and that thing, which he said was the Alpha, just stared him down for the longest time. He said he felt a primal fear that he's never ever known. And remember, he was in combat in one of the most horrific wars in our history. This was a man who didn't scare easily at all. Whatever he saw scared him to his core, so much so that he warned people not to walk around at night and carried guns on him just to defend himself if he ever came across one of these things again. Hearing him explain all this to me scared me to my core too, and I don't scare much myself. He didn't like being out at night, at all, and wouldn't be out at night often. And in fact, after he told me that, I realized that I normally saw him during the day. Well, that's my input. I've never seen anything like this myself, but a man I believe unequivocally did claim he saw something. I'm curious if anyone has ever had such an encounter with these things, and I'd like to know what you think they are, whether they're a werewolf or something else, and whether or not his silver bullets would have any effect on them. According to him, there's things out there that are so scary you'll piss your pants when you see them. They hide in the shadows of the night, and they'll feast on your flesh if you're not careful. This encounter happened late at night, while driving home from Snohomish from Sultan, the two towns being about 10 miles apart. I was with my mother, and we had just finished dropping a friend off in her home in Sultan. It was late October, and there was an unusual storm going on that night that everyone talked about the following day. We're talking tremendous cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning and a very cold, dry wind with no rain. There were bright flashes of light, loud thunder, and lots of leaves blowing around. After dropping our friend off, we were on a stretch of road that's very dark, with farmland on either side of the highway, which would be Highway 2, and both sides have densely wooded hills. We were driving in a 1991 Honda Accord, and at this one particular spot in the road, something caught my eye. It was off to the left side, which was a farm field and there was a break in the guardrail for a dirt road going up into the field. Right when we were at this break, I saw what looked like this huge dog coming up, and right then, it ran in front of our car, and I hit it. We could see the top of its back, which we both swear looked more like a hyena at this point than a dog. It had to be huge to see its back over the hood of the car. When you're sitting pretty low to the ground in a Honda Accord, you don't see much like that. Its fur was shaggy brown and molted with dark spots, just like a hyena, and its front seemed higher up than its back. The headlights lit it up as it ran right in front of our car, and we could feel it hit. But we didn't see it go either up in the air or off to the right side of the car. It was running from the left side of the highway to the right. We were driving westward. It sent my car into an uncontrollable swerve back and forth into the oncoming lane, and I just prayed that I could get it under control. To keep our car from getting into a head-on collision with what looked like maybe a Ford Aerostar van. But then, it seemed like this calmness came over me, and it was like I felt my guardian angel take control of the steering, 
because we missed the van by just a few inches. After going a little ways further, we were both so shook up that I pulled off to the side. My mother wanted to go out and look for this dog because we're both animal lovers. I felt bad for hitting it, but I had this bad feeling about looking for this dog. And I put dog in quotation marks because I really don't think it was a dog. It just looked so strange, and I was actually afraid of it. I don't know how to describe it, but something in my body was telling me not to go looking for this thing, because if I did, we might be in a lot of danger. It was dark and stormy after all, but the storm wasn't what was making me scared. It was the sight of whatever that creature was that we hit. It didn't feel safe, and I just wanted to get home. We got back in the car and stopped at a little gas station when we first got into Monroe which is the next town between ours and Sultan. We got out just to look at the front of the car, trying to assess the damage, thinking surely there would be some kind of evidence of hitting something that large. We were going the speedway limit, and that was 60 miles per hour. I was expecting at least a dent or some fur or blood, but there was nothing there. Not one single scratch. The whole thing had a very supernatural feeling to it. I don't know how else to describe that. The look of this dog creature, which was huge and looked more like a hyena, just didn't seem right. Neither did the timing of running into it in front of us. It was like it wanted to make us stop on that dark stretch of road and get out of my car, which we did, but we got right back in. I never saw this thing on two legs. It ran on all fours, but there was something so calculated about it. The way it came up to the highway, the way it looked at our car and then ran right in front of us, it just seemed planned. And I know that sounds crazy that an animal could plan something like that, but that's just how it seemed to us. And it was such a strange electromagnetic type of storm that night too. The next day, people we knew that lived miles and miles apart from each other in many different directions all talked about that storm and one particularly loud thunderclap that shook everyone's homes. They all thought it was directly over their house, but they were all miles apart. I don't know if that storm had anything to do with my dogman encounter, but throw those two together and the whole evening was just really, really creepy. The Fae were a big part of my upbringing, but my mom dislikes us even talking about them, except for the odd joke that I'm a changeling child. I have lots of little stories, from running into what could be a will-o'-the-wisp to a thing that watches me sleep. I honestly don't know what it is because I've never had the guts to roll over and look at it. But the biggest story I have, though, happened when I was about 10 years old. I had two friends. Amanda and Bonnie. We were lucky enough to live in an area where within 10 minutes you'd be in this forest that was split by a stream and bridge. Each half had a large pond or lake by it. There were all sorts of old stories about that place, from a witch being buried to big cats being seen stalking around. This was one of those places that just gave off those feelings, you know, like the veil was smaller you could see other things, or other things could be attracted to it. And as far as the two halves of the forest went, they couldn't be more different. The first half you'd come to always felt wrong. You'd never see wildlife there, never hear birds singing. While the trees had leaves on them, everything always looked like it was at the tail end of autumn. It was unsettling and creepy, just to say the least. I always just figured that perhaps the pond there had been polluted at some point from the local farms. But as I got older and had these experiences, I'm not so sure there was a natural reason for the constant state of decay. Maybe it was more of a supernatural reason. We'd often pass through the dead woods to get to the one that we actually enjoyed more. You see, once we got over that stream into the other wooded area, it was totally different. It was bright, 
You'd see deer, maybe even some fox. There was a big family of red kites there, and we used to watch them hunt and fly. We used to spend most of our weekends there, just exploring or swimming in the pond. That was when it was warmer. Occasionally, we would even fish for carp. One day, we stayed a little too long. We noticed that the sun was starting to set, and we realized we'd probably be grounded if we didn't get back home before dark. Our parents were pretty okay with us exploring the woods, as long as we weren't out after dark for obvious reasons. It was the 90s, but I guess it was still a different time back then. It was safer in our area, though. We crossed the stream into the dead woods, and it was just more unsettling than normal. I'd never been there when it was so dark, and we didn't even have a torch with us. I can't remember who suggested it, but we decided to go off the path to cut through some bushes to get to the housing estate nearby. Looking back on it as an adult, I can't believe I did that one thing. All the dumb people that do those in horror movies always end up dead. Take the shortcut. That's always a bad idea. It took us about 20 minutes to get through all the shrubs and to the final area at the edge of the woodland. We found a small hole, possibly from other kids or maybe even from animals. It was in the bushes, and one by one, we started crawling through it on our hands and knees. Amanda went first, then me. She helped me through when my hair got snagged, and then finally it was Bonnie's turn. But that's when shit hit the fan. Me and Amanda leaned down so we could help Bonnie through, and she started screaming. She kept screaming that something was grabbing her leg. We thought she was messing with us at first, but then we thought perhaps her leg was stuck on some brambles or something. We panicked, noticing that she was really having trouble getting through the thicket. So we grabbed her arms and tried pulling her through. This was the moment that real fear set in because something was holding onto her. Not only that, it was trying to pull her back into the woods. It's still a memory that scares me and brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. Right now, I have goosebumps all over just typing this. In all my life, I've never heard something scream like she was screaming. Not a person, not an animal. I've never seen true, real terror in somebody's eyes like I saw there. Eventually, she stopped screaming. I guess because her voice was sore, or maybe she was in shock. I don't even know how long we were in that tug of war, but by the time whatever it was had let go of her and we pulled her through, her legs were a mess. Amanda left us there to run and bang on the nearest house. She wanted to go get the police in an ambulance. Bonnie's legs were bloody and torn up, like someone had taken razor blades to her. The police told us she was probably attacked by a badger. I mean, they can be pretty nasty, but... I don't think they can hold on to a 10-year-old child with two other children pulling her. She was pretty traumatized by the whole incident, and we didn't really get to see her much after that. Eventually, I asked her if she'd seen what got her, as me and Amanda couldn't see it. All she said was that she could only see a figure made of darkness, with two red crimson eyes. She ended up moving about six months later. It was maybe two or three years later in high school that I heard anyone mention shadow people, let alone one in the dead woods. I kind of stayed far away after that. Hell, I'm scared of the dark and I'm nearly 30 at this point. But I remember some boys talking about it and I overheard them and how they'd seen things in those woods. I perked up and asked them what they saw and they started telling me about how people had been seeing shadowy figures in there. From the size of children all the way up to large creatures with red eyes. I remember feeling quite sick because I'd always assumed that Bonnie's story was caused by shock. It honestly was the scariest thing to have ever happened to me. The funny thing is, these two woods are on land owned by a local abbey and they're tended by local monks. Always made me wonder why, and if it had been Holy Land for some reason. 
or if these monks were trying to keep whatever it was contained into that area of the forest. This all happened about seven years ago now. Me and a couple of friends of mine were camping out in Arizona during a road trip on our way to Texas. This crazy shit happened to us that until this day, none of us can explain what the hell it was. I literally have no explanation. So hopefully you can shed some light on what the hell it was that we encountered that night. We were driving from California to Texas to get my friend's sister who was ending a marriage and moving back home. We told her we would all drive back to get her instead of her driving a moving truck by herself. It was me and two of my friends, Carl and John. The two of them decided they'd come so I wouldn't have to drive alone and so we could have an epic road trip. We planned on taking a week to get there just so we didn't have to rush and we'd stop and see whatever the hell we wanted to. My sister's ex-husband wasn't an asshole or anything like that. They were just ending a relationship on good terms, so it wasn't like it was a rush to get there or anything. Well, a memorable road trip? It definitely was. We were in some part of Arizona that I can't for the life of me remember. Maybe I blocked it out. The guys can't remember either. Honestly, I'm not even sure it was a town or city or anything. It was literally out in the middle of nowhere. All I know is after we got the hell out of there, we drove for about four or five hours before we reached New Mexico. We decided to do as much camping out as we could just to save money instead of renting a hotel room. And it was fun anyway. I was working part time at a Best Buy and the guys were both servers at restaurants, so money wasn't exactly flowing around us, you know. We figured camping would save us a lot of bread, especially if we just did it off the grid and not some camping ground. We'd done it the first two nights already, and had basically just taken our time from San Diego to wherever the hell we were at, Arizona. It was all hella fun, until the night we camped out in Arizona. It was late at this point, after 10 o'clock, and the three of us were all sitting around our campfire, having a few beers and eating some burgers that we cooked up. We were planning on reaching New Mexico the next day, and I was really trying to convince the guys that we should go to Roswell. I was into aliens and stuff, but... I wouldn't say I was one of those people that were obsessed with them. I mean, I believe they exist, but I never went out looking for proof myself. Anyways, at some point I started whistling, and John quickly told me to shut up, that you shouldn't whistle at night. I knew he had a thing about it, and I was really just doing it to get a reaction out of him. He's Vietnamese, and his culture believes that if you whistle at night, you can attract some bad spirits. I wasn't superstitious. And I still think it was a coincidence that all of this happened here. But this is what I remember. I started whistling. He told me to shut up, and we laughed about it. But a little while later, I did it again. And that's when all hell broke loose. John was just telling me to stop again when this blood-curdling, insane scream sounded off in the darkness. Where we were, it was pitch black. We weren't around any town or lights or anything, just desert, desert and more desert, so we were really isolated. I remember all three of us getting really quiet and asking what in the name of God that was. John said God had nothing to do with it, which just sent a chill down my spine. But Carl tried to convince us that it was a mountain lion or some shit, but it didn't sound like he was even convinced himself. This sounded unnatural, and honestly it sounded evil to me even before everything else happened. It sounded like whatever it was out there was pissed that we were there or something. It screamed again, and it sounded a whole lot closer than it should have been based off of how far away it sounded the first time. This thing was moving fast. I don't know if anyone listening has ever played a game called Left 4 Dead, but there's this thing in the game called a hunter, and it screams when it's close to you. It sounded pretty similar to that. I would suggest going on YouTube and trying to find that sound if you can. Carl had his pistol with him. It was something he insisted we have during a road trip, just in case. Luckily, neither of the other two of us had any problems with it, and he usually had it on him. He had it out before I could even tell him to grab it, 
and we all just kind of huddled together for a minute, waiting to see if we could hear it again, staying as close to the light of the fire as we could without actually catching fire ourselves. We might not have had the best jobs in the world, and we definitely weren't the best college-educated kids out there, but believe me, we're not stupid either. We weren't about to go off into the darkness and investigate some scary-ass sound just so we could say we figured out what it was. And we decided it was very much time to leave that place. We loaded our stuff up and put out the fire. As we were getting ready to leave, we heard something big running around, not too far from us. I could have sworn I not only saw something moving in the darkness, but that whatever the hell that thing was, was on two legs and not four. Carl even said it didn't sound like it had four legs. All three of us heard this insanely loud and angry growl too. Carl whispered to both of us to get in the car. He stood there with his gun ready to shoot as we did. I guess he felt since he had the gun it was his job to get us into safety first and then he could worry about himself. I drove the hell out of there as fast as we could. It was crazy dark but I was sure no one else was around. I could have seen the headlights for miles at this point. All three of us were talking at once, trying to figure out what the hell it was that we just encountered. John looked at me and said, that's why you don't whistle at night, dumbass. To this day, Carl still agrees with him that it was me that brought out this thing because I was whistling. He also did a shitload of research and told us that it was probably a skinwalker that we encountered. Apparently, they're very real. We drove until sun came up. We made it to New Mexico and decided it'd be better to rent a motel room that night. They made me sleep on the floor because they both agreed that I was the reason that they were too scared to go camping. I didn't really argue. I just wanted to sleep. We didn't stop in Roswell either. We'd had enough paranormal experiences for one trip. When we picked our friend up, we stayed in motels all the way back because we had such an awful experience. We told her all about it, and freaked her out too. She'd wanted to do the camping thing just like us, but after our stories, changed her mind. Honestly, I don't know if it was a skinwalker, or if it was something else, but it definitely wasn't a freaking mountain lion. Also, though I'm sure it's not the reason, I try to remember not to whistle at night anymore. This was only a few years ago in the spring or summertime. I live in Utah and loved exploring with my ex-wife and stepson. We did a lot of geocaching around Utah to keep the stepson entertained. He was still pretty young, like five or so, and it gave my ex and I the opportunity to see what all of Utah has to offer. We'd also made sure that at least once a month, she and I would go away somewhere and camp, hike, explore, you know, you get the idea. So during one of our trips, it happened to fall on a weekend where my ex had her son, and I had gotten off work early on that Friday, so we made a last minute plan to drive down to Monument Valley and camp out there and then do some hiking in the morning. We would left that afternoon and didn't get down there until a little after midnight. There were no clouds in the sky, no major light pollution, and the stars as far as your eyes could see. If you haven't spent time far, far away from cities, you'd be surprised how much light pollution prevents you from actually seeing the nighttime sky. We checked out with the hotel that's right at the rim of the overlook for Monument Valley, but they were a little too pricey for us, so we pulled off the main road where there was this old, like, really deserted parking area that made a semicircle as it jutted off the main road. Completely surrounding that semicircle of red sand and carports were miles of sagebrush and rocks. There are no paths exiting the semicircle. Remember this part. We pulled in and had the headlights of the car facing the tent that faced the road. We laid down our tarp, set up the tent, got all cozy in the sleeping bags, and went to sleep. Right around 3 a.m., I get nudged awake by my ex asking, Did you hear that? To which I said no. And that's when I heard two things outside of the tent. I completely froze up because then I saw my ex-wife's face and it put chills down my spine. She'd apparently been awake for about 10 minutes before waking me up because she heard these things fighting outside. 
When I realized what was going on, that's when I heard them fighting too. It sounded like two dogs the size of bears slugging it out. Like they made noises that I'll never forget. Like the deepest guttural dog-like human growl and gnashing of teeth that you could ever imagine. The two things I presume heard me loosen my buck knife that I always keep under my pillow because they immediately stopped fighting and started running around our tent. I could hear their deep breaths and powerful feet hitting the ground. Then they immediately sprinted off towards the road. Remember where the car was facing, sagebrush to the east, semicircle, main road to the west. And then they started attacking each other again. That's when I hear a horse snorting roughly three feet from my head. I hadn't heard a horse walk up or make any noise. It was just suddenly there. And you know that feeling you get when you just know that something or someone is looking at you even though you can't see them? It was that. Plus this overwhelming sense of dread and sheer terror. Well, even though it was spring and summertime, we left the rain fly on just in case of some random spring storms. I couldn't see through it, nor did I even want to. I didn't even want to move because I was afraid it would try to get inside the tent. So I slowly unsheathed my knife and turned my back, and that's when I heard this horse try to open my car doors. I could hear it snorting like a horse does, or at least it was something that sounded a lot like a horse when it was snorting around and flicking at my door handles of my car. I could hear it start at the passenger side then work its way around, flicking each door handle until it had gone around the entire vehicle twice. Once it gave up on the doors, it came back to the tent. That's where I accepted that we were all going to die. I've had some paranormal stuff happen to me that spooked me. I've seen scary movies, etc., etc., but I've never been so scared that I literally felt all the will to stay alive just leave my body. I had accepted that this was evil, Evil was here and now, and it was here to kill me, my wife, and my stepson. Words seriously cannot explain how much dread was in the air. It was so heavy, I was drowning in it. Then after what felt like an eternity, this horse creature got up, walked away from my tent towards the east, where the sagebrush was, and the dog things left. That was it. Nothing after that. So... At first light, my ex and I immediately opened the tent and started looking around at what was outside. I didn't sleep for several hours after that encounter. I just stayed up listening, making sure that I could protect these two that were dependent on me. If those things came back, I'd throw my life out there for them. Luckily, it didn't come back. But we saw hoof prints around the car, and they led right into the sagebrush and literally just disappeared. There were zero tracks of any horse once the footprints entered the sagebrush. We found the dog thing's tracks too, and then she and I both saw that they were indeed not dog tracks, because these tracks left in the sand were about the size of my shoe, which is a size 11 and a half in American standards. These were unnaturally large. I've seen bear prints this size, but on dogs, hell no. So we packed up and got the hell out of there as soon as we had everything torn down. We snapped a couple of photos and then immediately took off. Paranormal stuff like this makes me real nervous because that overwhelming feeling of evil will never go away. Plus, after talking to a Navajo buddy of mine, he told me what we most likely encountered was a skinwalker. And we were lucky to make it out of there alive. They can mimic all kinds of noises. So I think that's what it was making that noise out there. As for those two giant dog things, hell, maybe we even had a combination of an encounter with dogmen and a skinwalker. Or maybe the dogmen were stalking our tent first, and they were afraid when the skinwalker came and got the hell out of there. Either way, screw that noise. I'm never going back there. I'm now 77 years old, but I still find time to ramble about in the mountains of western Montana, where I've made my home for the last 45 years. 
I have always been fascinated by stories of werewolves and Bigfoot creatures, and have had many of my own encounters to share. Way back when I was 18 or so, I lived with my parents in upstate New York. It was in the town of Greenwood Lake. One afternoon, I went out to see if I could shoot a few squirrels for dinner. I took my old 22 and went up maybe a quarter mile or so up the hill to the north end of the lake. It was a beautiful fall afternoon and the usual birds, bugs, and forest creatures were busy doing what they do. I sat down against a big tree to wait for the squirrels to go back to feeding. It was so peaceful that I soon drifted off to sleep. But only a few minutes later, I awoke with a start. The whole woods had changed. It was as still as a tomb. Not a bug or bird was stirring. I felt a cold chill all over. Whatever it was seemed to be advancing down the hill in my direction. Now I'm not ashamed to admit it. I fled down that hill like the devil was chasing after me. And hell, maybe he was. At any rate, as soon as I got down where the houses and yards started, the evil aura or whatever it was was gone and everything seemed to be back to normal. I don't know how long a letter I can write so I'm going to break this into several short stories. If you're interested, stick with me. In 1964, I was working on a ranch in upstate New York, near Albany. I was training horses. I had done my service in the army, and having learned a lot about life and politics, as this was in the Goldwater time, I spent my spare time as a sort of community organizer. I spent many evenings late into the morning hours talking with people about the politics of the day, and it always seemed that the talk would get around to things like UFOs, Wendigos, Bigfoot, and other things that go bump in the night. I don't know what things in particular, but this caused me to get on their radar. And then one day, I stopped into a roadhouse that I was known to frequent now and then for a cool one after work, you know. A friend named Joe sighted over to me and said, you better lay low for a while. I asked why, because I was honestly confused and surprised. As far as I knew, I was an upstanding citizen. But he told me, the FBI was in here a few days ago looking for you. Now that made me sit up. I wanted to know what they said. And I wanted to know what they looked like. He said they were just asking about me, like where I might be and so forth. He said that they were strange looking, all dressed in black. They flashed badges and what looked like IDs. He told me that one of the guys was a short Asian fellow and that he was the one that did most of the talking. The other guy, he was real tall and skinny. He never spoke. He just took up a position over in the corner where his eyes covered everybody. That guy gave everyone the shivers. When they left, They were driving a brand new looking older model Cadillac sedan, all black of course. It was some years later that I heard about the men in black from Ivan Sanderson and several other people that I talked to. But that wasn't the end of the story though. I thought it was weird that these people would come looking for me when all I did was talk about the paranormal every once in a while. Maybe they knew something that I didn't and they wanted to keep me quiet. Maybe I was stirring up ideas for the townsfolk, and that was giving them some trouble. I was at work one day, and I was paged that I had to come to the office. There was a man waiting there to see me, who claimed to be from the IRS. He was an overweight, balding, office-looking type, who obviously wasn't enjoying the heat. He had on a light tan raincoat, brown slacks, and a print shirt that wouldn't stay tucked into his pants. He showed me a photocopy of my previous year's tax form and claimed that I had underpaid the IRS, but only by $5. I wrote him a check and he left. Now, have you ever heard of the IRS sending someone into the field to collect five bucks? By the way, that check was never cashed. In about that same time, I had moved a couple of times and I left some of my things at the ranch in an old shed. One day, 
When I went back to get them, the folks there told me that the guys that I had sent to get them had taken them away. Needless to say, I hadn't sent anybody, and nobody even knew that they were there. In thinking about these things later, for one, in black magic, a person's signature, like the one on my check, is very powerful. And two, a couple of items that were in the shed were an old rifle stock that had plenty of my sweat on it and an old axe. That axe not only had my sweat on it, but blood as well, from a cut on my leg once. More powerful tokens to use against me. I know that seems crazy and hell, it's just an idea that ran through my mind. But sometimes I wonder how many guardian angels got their wings singed over me. There was another time in my life when I was hunting in the mountains in upstate New York, near the Canadian border at Blue Mountain Lake. It was about 300 miles from my home and I'd got there quite late. It had snowed a couple of inches that day and the moon was showing through a low ceiling of clouds. I slept a bit in the back of my truck, then wolfed down a quick breakfast before starting off down the trail at about 4 a.m. I was sure of the trail, so I just stuffed the sandwich and a couple of candy bars into my pockets. My rifle held five shells, and I had my knife, so I was well prepared, or so I thought. The trail was clear in the weak moonlight, but the woods on either side were deep and dark. After a while, I became aware of what sounded like footsteps in the crunchy snow off to my left. I wasn't sure if it was maybe just echoes of my own steps off in the trees, but it was making me edgy. I decided to try an old Indian trick, so I walked on a few more yards and then stopped suddenly. Whatever it was, walked on another couple of paces and then it stopped too. Hmm. Now I was feeling spooked. I tried the trick again, and I guess whatever it was, just wasn't too smart, because it fell for it again. A short way ahead, it sounded like footsteps moved on ahead of me, and then moved off to my right and up the hill. I wasn't at all unhappy to have it gone, I can tell you that, but what lay ahead was even more perplexing. A small stream crossed the trail, and there were clear tracks pressed deep into the soft ground. I'm a good tracker, but these were cloven hoof prints left by something quite heavy. And the scariest part, whatever it was, was walking on two legs. That's right. Some big unidentified creature with cloven hooves and two legs was walking around the forest with me. I sat down on a big rock, clutched my rifle close and waited for morning. Once the sun hit, I jammed back to my vehicle, and I got the hell out of there. I never saw what it was, but I can imagine it wasn't something pretty. It might be something deadly. And again I ask, how many guardian angels have got their wings singed just looking out for me? My encounter happened at my dad's girlfriend's house during broad daylight in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, just off of River Road. Behind the house was a forest, but it's a bit dense to play back there, so we'd usually follow a deer trail into the woods till there was a clearing where there was a barbed fence that cut right through the middle of it. We'd hop a fence and go through the woods. On the other side was planted pine forest that ran along the fence for the airport. It was a pretty wide area back there so you can see straight down the road to the other side. My brother and I were back there with the girlfriend's nephew, just tromping along with airsoft guns and shooting at each other once in a while. You know, just being kids, really. Well, at the very end of this area is a fire trail, but we call it a road, and on the other side of the road is a dense forest. We reached the road and stopped and talked like we usually do, looking for deer tracks or squirrels, and then we smelled some really skunky bad smell. My brother and I both felt the urge at the same time to look up towards the road at the airport fence. What I saw was what looked like the head of a huge black wolf. But whatever this thing was, just didn't look right. I knew right away that it wasn't just any wolf. 
His ears were in the right spots. They looked droopy, if you ask me. But his eyes looked off, like they were too big and bright for his face. His front legs were long and skinny, but he was standing like a wolf. My brother and I looked at each other, and here's where I'm going to mention that my brother and I are very close, so usually we can just give each other a look and know what it meant. So here we are, giving each other a look, and I instantly started to briskly walk back towards the way we came. The girlfriend's nephew just started to walk with us, and he asked what was up, but we shushed him. Even seeing that thing from that far away, I could tell that something was wrong with it. I just had this feeling of dread come over me. We were being as quiet as we could. We knew that it could hear every step or movement because of the way that its ears looked and that it was a canine and canines have really good hearing. Once we hopped the barbed wire fence, we ran as fast as we could to the house. Once we got back to the entrance, we looked back and there that thing was looking at us through the brush. We didn't even hear it move behind us to follow us. No sound at all. This thing moved without any type of noise. What kind of creature can do that? Even a mountain lion or some kind of animal that hunts its prey just to survive makes some kind of noise. But when this thing moved, it was absolutely silent. Now, my brother and I have been raised on 80 acres of land just south of here. We've seen wolf and bear and moose and mountain lions, coyotes, pretty much everything else. Neither of us have ever seen a wolf that big and lanky in our lives. We pointed it out to the nephew and we all just watched this thing walk back into the deep woods. I still had that sense of primal fear, like I knew we all had to get away from it, but not to show it that we were afraid. I felt like if we ran, it would have taken us down. So that's why we just walked as quickly as possible back to our home. The first thing my brother and I were ever taught, having lived off of the land like we did, was to never ever run from a predator because it'll see you as prey and it will chase you down and kill you. My brother and I told my dad, but he didn't seem to be interested about anything that we were saying. So the next morning, my brother and I went back out to look for tracks or any proof that this thing was there. We did find huge dog-like tracks and about five and a half feet up a tree following this route, we found some thick black fur. We never caught another sight of that thing though. And now after all these years, it's my belief that we encountered a dog man that day. At that point in our investigation, we had had enough. We were getting unnerved again and that feeling of foreboding was starting to creep in over us. To top it off, it seemed like the forest was starting to go quiet. That also meant that a predator was nearby. And as far as I was concerned, it was that big black dog thing that was walking around silently in the forest, probably even stalking us. We decided that enough was enough and we got out of there as fast as we could. And we never went back out there without some kind of protection. When my encounter happened, it was September of 1999. I was working at an air force base in the north side of Duluth, Minnesota. I was a security forces airman and I was on the third shift. North of this base is a very wooded area where there's trees everywhere. My job was pretty boring. I worked 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. full time. I was doing my normal rounds, checking doors, fence lines, stuff like that. And it was very late at night on the north side of the base. That's when my headlights caught something that I couldn't explain. They were almost eye level with me and I was sitting in a Ford F-150. During the third shift, we worked a skeleton crew, so I was patrolling this area by myself. At first, I thought it was just a very big buck. Some of the guys had seen this buck around the property, like a 16-pointer or something even bigger than that size. I was less than 100 yards from it and saw these eyes reflecting back at me from the headlights of my truck. I have got to see this thing, I thought to myself and I accelerated and started speeding towards the field. Everything after that happened so fast that it's hard to explain. I was by a baseball field and there was this little slope there. It went down probably less than 20 feet into a brush line. After that brush line, there was a thick set of trees. 
The brush itself probably only came up to my chest, but it was pretty thick to walk through. When I turned my truck towards this thing, I just caught the ass end of it, leading down from the slope and out of sight from my headlights. It had to be less than 20 feet ahead of me when it leaped. It had a long tail behind its legs that looked exactly like a dog's. Same with the back paws, but the paws were gigantic. I only saw the back end of this thing, but I can tell you right here and now that this thing was absolutely gigantic. I've told this story many times before. The best thing I can use to describe it was to say it was like a wolf or a dog in nature. The paws on this thing were bigger than my hands. The hair or fur or whatever you want to call it was wavy and matted and thick, and it was light brown, maybe even blondish. The ass end of this thing was bigger than any deer or black bear or buck or even moose that I've ever seen. The things I remember clearly are the tail that had to be more than two feet long, and the back paws as well as the color, and the way that hair was matted but still wavy at the same time. My entire encounter happened within less than 10 seconds. I sat in my truck for a little bit, confused and... I was just telling myself that I couldn't have seen what I saw. But the truth is, I know what I saw. I got out of the truck with my flashlight and my M16 rifle and started searching the perimeter. I heard something, probably like this thing, running through the woods right in front of me, heading in a northwest direction. This thing made a lot of noise. Like something huge, like a buck or moose running through the trees. I'll admit that after that I started to get scared, and I was thinking to myself, whatever this thing was, my M16 isn't going to do a lot of good. This thing isn't normal. I don't know if it was a wolf or what it was, but I had to get out of there. I got back to my truck pretty quickly, and I headed back to the headquarters. Now, I can identify animals pretty well. I know the North Woods very well. I know what I saw. There's no way I misidentified this thing. It looked like a werewolf. Or now, as I learn more, a dogman. You see, I'm trained as an officer to observe details. I've hunted, I've worked with animals. I know what I saw. But I never told any other members of the base for fear of ridicule. Or even, worst case scenario, losing my job because they thought that I was on drugs or hallucinating. I wish to remain anonymous. Like I said, at the time of this encounter, it was on an Air Force base. I don't know who's listening to this, and I would really not like to get in trouble in case this could be considered classified information. But I just had to share this story. I know it seems implausible, but I swear to you, it's completely true. During August 1955, my stepdad was stationed at Yokota Air Force Base in Japan. We'd been there about a year, and I had made some friends with several boys my own age. Before going back to school, we decided to go camping for the weekend. We rode our bikes over the Tama River Bridge towards Hachioji. Just past the bridge, we took a dirt path to the right going up a steep hill to the top. In about a quarter mile, we came to a small camp area that a family ran that we had become friends with. We set up camp, and it was about 6 p.m. when the family invited us to eat with them. We did so, and actually had a pretty great time. About 8 o'clock, Kenny and I decided to go look at the view looking over the river from a picnic table about 25 yards from the house. The picnic table was separated only by a few trees from their house. The rest of the guys went back to the campsite and made a fire. Kenny was laying on the bench to the left of me while I was on the tabletop, Looking up into the sky, I saw a small light moving above. I yelled to Kenny to look. Just then, we were covered in a bright and warm light. Next, we're standing together at the end of the table in front of me and facing towards the campsite. We said nothing and walked by the house into the campsite. The other guys started asking if we'd gone to town and said they'd been looking for us. I remember saying no, and Kenny said no as well. Then Kenny added that we were at the picnic table. Jack, 
who was another one of the guys with us, said, no, we were just up there 15 minutes ago, and we've been looking for you for the past hour or so. That's the last thing I remember until 8 the next morning. Kenny and I woke up at the same time, and the other guys had eaten and were coming back from their bike trip. They said they tried to wake us up, but they couldn't. Kenny and I never talked about the incident, and his dad, a major in the Air Force, was transferred a year later. It wasn't until the mid-80s while I was traveling through Ohio when I heard a late-night radio show regarding missing time. The incident in Japan rang a bell. Hell, Kenny and I had been missing for several hours. I wonder if maybe we had experienced the missing time because we were abducted. Sometime later, while back at home, I told my wife about my experiences in Japan as well. She surprised me by saying that we had a strange visitor in the middle of the night while we were living in California. It scared her so much that she never told me. But she described the notorious gray alien. Sometime later in the 80s, we lived in Iowa, and we owned a manufacturing business. I was a mechanical engineer and had several patented inventions for meat processing equipment that we based our business on. During this period of time, I brought to my wife's attention an object that was under my skin that seemed to be moving from one area of my body to another. I even had my chief engineer and friend verify this. We thought it might be shrapnel from Vietnam, where I served in the war in the 60s. In the early 90s, a doctor removed it from my back, and we looked at it. It was about a quarter of an inch long, and it tapered at the ends, but not sharp, sort of rounded off. He threw it away, saying that it just looked like cast steel. I wish we had kept it after what I found out later regarding these objects found in other abductees. Years later, that same doctor recommended that I get a prostate examination. I had the exam and the doctor said that the area was filled with scar tissue. He asked if I had a prostate exam before. I had absolutely never had one. Another bell rang loud. Something has happened to me without my knowledge or conscious knowledge of it. Someone I was telling the story to recommended that I have regression hypnosis to find out what happened. For two boys at 13 to never talk about the light that appeared to them is unusual at best. I did so. I had the regression hypnosis, and I had a flashback that scared the hell out of me. The hypnosis therapist got so excited he asked me to wait while he went to get a colleague to listen. I didn't wait. I left the doctor's office and never looked back. There was more than one type of alien aboard this craft, now that I remember what happened. I remember being naked and on a cold bench of some sort, scared shitless. The tall white alien never talked but instilled in my mind that I was safe, but I was justified being scared. He seemed to care for us as we would for a puppy dog. I think they were disappointed that I was not Japanese. I remembered something else later too. I was warned that there are others out there who have no regards for our well-being. The whole thought of extraterrestrial beings out there that are more powerful than us and can just abduct us whenever they want is so scary that I try not to talk about this too much. But I figured since I was here, I'd let you know what happened to me all those years ago in Japan. I know it sounds cliche, but we are not alone. I have a confession. I'm 22 years old and still afraid of the dark. Because of that, I like to sleep with my blinds open so the streetlights shine into my room. Most of the time, it's comforting to stare at the orange glow on my wall intermixed with the shadows of the open blinds. The window itself is four feet long and three and a half feet tall. There's nothing extraordinary about my window, except that it keeps my fear of the dark in check. Until the night I experience something I'll never forget, that is. Something that will keep me not only from keeping my blinds open at night anymore, but from ever even looking out the window at night again. It was Wednesday, June 14th, 2007 to be exact, around 1 a.m. in Tonganoxie, Kansas. I'd gone to bed around 11 p.m. and fell asleep pretty quickly. 
I'd had a rough day and just wanted to sleep off my stress. The only thing that night added was a lot more stress. I slowly woke up and blinked the sleep from my eyes, looked at the shadows on my wall where the light was cast in, and my blood ran absolutely cold. There in the shadows was a human-ish figure at my window. I say human-ish because whatever it was, was completely disproportioned. The shoulders were way too wide and the chest was too skinny, like it was stretched out or flattened. The head was pretty large too, and I could clearly see the long pointed ears at the sides of its head. I was paralyzed. I didn't know what I saw or what was looking in, and I prayed to God that it didn't see me. Actually, I was pretty confident that it couldn't see me. My bed was directly under the window, and I had a big blanket on. Nonetheless, I refused to move a muscle. I lay there for what felt like hours. It had to be at least an hour, maybe more. This thing only ever moved so slightly, back and forth, like it was shifting its weight or something, and I could tell by the shadow that it looked like it was bobbing its head back and forth, like it was trying to see inside the room. I was as pressed up against the wall as possible, only a little bit of my head and eyes sticking out of the blanket just so I could keep an eye on this thing. And did I mention that I was petrified? I was freezing cold even with the blanket on. I couldn't stop shaking. And then something worse happened. This thing looked to the left, and I could see by the shadow that it had a snout. It wasn't long by any means, but it was definitely elongated. You asked me if I thought it could be a dog man or something like that about the snout. I never actually looked at the thing, so I can't say for sure, but I really don't think it can be based on the descriptions that I've heard about a dog man. This thing had a muzzle for sure, but it wasn't a canine snout. It was too short for that. Almost like the main creature from the island of Dr. Moreau with Marlon Brando. In fact, as I was lying there, trying not to breathe too loudly or scream and let this thing know where I was, that's exactly what I imagined was outside my window. Anyways, it looked to the left, like it was looking at something, and it stayed that way for about a minute or so, like it was listening to something or for something. I thought about taking the opportunity to run, but I didn't want to draw its attention back to me and have it crash through my window. It was obvious that it wanted something in that room, since it stayed there for so long looking in. Was it me? Did it want me? Did it know I was there? So I just watched in terror as this thing looked off to the left and then turned its attention back to my room. I was still too afraid to move. I was almost too afraid to breathe. I could feel my heart pounding, just absolutely pounding inside my chest and I was afraid that it would beat so loud that that thing could hear it. Because all that separated us was a pane of glass. As eternity ticked by, I could only pray. Pray that it would just go away and leave me alone. Pray that morning would come quickly. Pray that this thing wouldn't kill me. But if it did, I'd be dead before it started to devour me. Eventually, whatever this thing was finally backed away. But it did so really, really slowly. And from the look of the shadow, it didn't turn around either. It just slowly backed away. At first, I thought it was doing something so that it could charge the window and crash through. That's actually when I was the most afraid. My body was so tense, I thought it was all going to cramp up. Luckily, that thing charging to the window and smashing through never came to pass. And it just finally left. Still though, I stayed in that same spot. I didn't want to move just in case it was still there and I just couldn't see it. I stayed there, curled in my blanket, wide awake, staring at the shadows on my wall until it was light outside. And that's my story. What does everyone think could have been at my window? And oh yeah, one more thing about my window that I didn't mention. 
I live on the second floor, and there's nowhere anything could stand outside of my window. No balcony, no ledge. So whatever this thing was, it could levitate or fly. What was it that was hovering around my window that night? All I could think about is that part in Salem's lot where the vampire is trying to get into the little boy's room and floats outside his window, begging for an invitation. Believe me, it still scares the shit out of me just thinking about it. For some background information, I live in the California foothills. My parents and I moved into this house from the city in late 2017, after this house had been sitting empty for over a year. The day we moved in, my mother and I arrived first to clean while my father and brother drove the moving truck. Right off the bat, I just had this weird feeling of uneasiness that I couldn't explain, but I just tried to write it off as it was a new place and I wasn't comfortable with it yet. But the property felt heavy. That's the only way that I can describe it. Some people here describe a feeling of being watched inside their homes, but I had that feeling anytime I stepped outside. Like I knew there was something out there that was just watching us. When we got there, though, we were supposed to sweep and mop the floors, dust the baseboards and windowsills, and once we were done, I started noticing this white granular powder all along the baseboards. It was on the windowsills too, and the doorways. I immediately told my mother, who told me not to worry about it and sweep it up. By the time I got everything swept up and cleaned off the windowsills, I was certain that this was salt. And it was a lot of it. But fine, whatever. Again I just tried to brush it off, ignoring that uneasy feeling too. The people that lived here might have just been superstitious. That's fine. I could live with that. We unpacked the truck over the next week, and I was setting up my room when the next bizarre event started happening. Knocking on the windows. Always quick raps that sounded like someone knocking with their knuckles. It would happen so often on all the windows in the house. But when you would turn, no one would even be there. You'd go outside, no one would be around the house. No footprints, no sign, nothing. And it only escalated. My brother and I would walk the dogs around the property. They were small, older dogs who were always good-natured and calm, except any time they went outside this new house. They would growl and puff out and get extremely agitated. They'd run around barking and stare off into the tree line and just act really, really weird. They hated being outside. And then we started finding the animal carcasses. They were always small creatures, like rats or toads or bats. The biggest we ever found was a raccoon. The animal had been gutted. It was one deliberate single slash down their torso, starting with their chest and ending near their rear. Never did they ever have any internal organs left. They looked practically mummified, like something had sucked the fluid and blood and organs right out of them. It was the one most bizarre and brutal thing that we experienced the entire time that any of this was going on, and by far the most bizarre thing that I've ever seen in my life. My brother would stay up late in his room on his computer every night. He liked to game with his friends until the early morning hours. He's not one to spook easy either, but on more than one occasion, I would wake up to him shaking me awake terrified saying something massive on two legs was walking around outside his bedroom window which he would leave open at night he said it would walk right up to his bedroom window and stop and then he could hear it breathing whatever it was sounded big and the breathing was deep and animalistic he'd look towards the window where the sounds were coming from and hear this thing scrambling away i never saw it with my own eyes and neither did he but the motion lights would come on outside and activate every single time that my brother would experience this. They were the lights that were leading to the woods near the back of our property. I know what you're thinking. Everything can probably just be explained by normal circumstances. Everything can be explained rationally, 
It could be a crazy person living in the woods or some neighbor messing with us for whatever reason. Well, that's what I told myself too, so I could sleep a little easier at night. But then the banging started. It was so loud, and it would sound like it was coming from everywhere all at once. The walls would literally vibrate. Picture frames would rattle right off of the walls. It was like something massive, stronger than any crazy person, was pounding on the exterior walls of the house, always super late at night, and always in more place than just one. So it made me scared that there were more than one of these creatures wandering around our property and spying on us, looking in our windows and agitating our dogs, killing all these poor forest creatures and doing whatever it did to them by sucking out their guts or whatever. I was afraid that it would end up with my dogs being hurt, or worse, one of us. I could never pinpoint the source of these bangings directly. My brother and I would stumble out of our bedrooms, petrified, and my mom would lead us to her room where we would all stay after that. My dad would walk around the perimeter of our property with his gun, but never found anything. Not so much as a footprint. Definitely not any people or creatures wandering around. It was like whatever this thing was would come over, terrify us, and then vanish into thin air. All this happened for probably six months, and every time one of these major events would happen, my dad would go outside with his rifle and walk around the perimeter. He'd always come back with nothing. We all felt like we were going insane because there was some unseen monster harassing us. And then suddenly, all of it just stopped. The mutilated animals stopped appearing. I stopped feeling like I was being watched anytime I went outside. My dogs stopped being so on edge anytime I took them out. They stopped staring out into the woods. And the property itself just felt lighter. Like you could finally take a deep breath after holding it in for so long. I genuinely have no explanation for what happened or even a clue as to what these creatures could have been. Maybe some being from another world or some kind of haunting entity, but my gut tells me that this creature was flesh and blood and that there was more than one. I'm just glad that whatever it was seemed to move on. There's a lot of different things it could be up in the California foothills, I guess. There's a lot of stories of Sasquatch up here, but some people I talk to tell me it could have been a dog man or maybe even a skinwalker or something called a rake. Truthfully, I don't know what it was, and I'm perfectly fine not really ever figuring it out, just in case it wants to come back. I would rather just tell my story and hear other people's opinions than be able to shed any more light on it because of another encounter. My name is Gabriel Santos Cabral. I'm 20 years old now, but my encounter happened when I was six years old, turning seven. Back then, my family and I lived in a country stead in Brazil. It wasn't a rural property. It was more like a country summer house, but in the city. The property was just outside the suburbs in the northwestern part of the city, edging the city limits and nearing the country. It was an approximately 420 square meters piece of land surrounded by two meter walls for more privacy. The house sat in a far corner of the property with a good view of the surroundings. I would say 90 to 95% view of the whole property from the front porch of the house. The region resembles Northern Missouri or Northeastern Kansas, but it's tropical rather than temperate or subtropical. The city is a metropolitan area with a population of 486,000 people. It would resemble Wichita or Kansas City. The landscape is fairly flat with some hills. The scenery has little vegetation with only some parks and nature preserves. None big enough to have a decent population of any medium or large animal species whatsoever. Now let me stress this to you. There are no bears in Brazil and the largest predator found here in the wild are the maned wolf the South American cougar and a subspecies of jaguar, none of which really could be identified as what I saw. My encounter was brief, but it was clear enough for me to make out the shape of this creature. I saw its color and its size. 
And so now, on to what I saw. It was Friday, October 18th, 2002. It was mid-spring in the Southern Hemisphere. And that night, there was a full moon with relatively cloudy skies. We had a dozen dogs on the property, which all slept together in a large kennel on the side of the house. They would be pretty quiet most nights, but not on that night. They were unsettled and spooked, every single one of them. One of the dogs managed to escape from the kennel and was desperately trying to get into the house. I was alone in the house with my mom at the time, and she asked me to turn on the floodlights outside and check what all the commotion was about. I did that and went to the front porch to scan the area, trying to see what could have scared all of our dogs. Staring off into the corner where we had a mango tree, 90 to 120 meters away, I saw this large grayish creature running on all fours, avoiding the lights. It passed behind the mango tree and disappeared into the dark. As I saw it, I immediately identified it as being a werewolf, just like that from the movie Bad Moon, which was a movie back in 1996, but with a slightly larger head, a thicker snout, and a bulkier build. On its hind legs, it must have stood, at the very least, as tall as the property wall, two meters, or six foot five. I froze for a few seconds after seeing it. It was only a brief sighting, lasting probably two to three seconds, and as soon as I recovered from the shock of seeing that thing, I sprinted as fast as I could back into the house, locked all the doors, and closed the windows that were still open. I was familiarized with werewolf movies back then. I was already aware of the impossibility of there being someone that could shapeshift into a monster. But what I saw was unmistakably similar to a werewolf. So since that encounter, I started to believe in werewolves, only under the same concept of dogmen, which I believe are natural rather than supernatural, and they look that way 24-7. Dogman is a term which I only recently come across, but I like it a lot better than werewolf. And that this encounter I had with a dogman, just like in the U.S. where there are places where sightings are frequent, there are places in Brazil where they happen frequently too. In the U.S., it would be Elkhorn, Taylor, and Marshall, Texas. In Brazil, we have places like Juanapolis and Tres Lagoas. Juanapolis has had sightings of werewolves and dogmen ever since its foundation. Its first mayor was actually said to be a werewolf back in the mid to late 1800s. The town is filled with werewolf references, actually. Tres Lagoas has had many sightings ever since the late 1980s and early 1990s. There was a series of nights in this small city in the 1990s where people claimed that a werewolf was roaming the streets at night after dark, trying to invade houses. It was climbing on roofs and howling all night long. It was scaring people's dogs and attacking livestock. The people around there were really scared. After hearing those encounters, I thought about my dogs and how spooked they were, and it just made me believe that these creatures were actually real and that what I saw wasn't my imagination. The state police actually began reinforcing night patrols and started investigating these creatures, assuming that someone was out at night, maybe in a suit, scaring people. But some cryptozoologists have visited our area too, collecting DNA samples. And as it turned out, what they found wasn't human or actually any kind of known animal and it certainly wasn't artificial hair from a suit. So you tell me what's really going bump in the night, because in my opinion, there are creatures out there that look just like the werewolves from movies, just like the one I saw running around on our property. And in my opinion, the werewolf from Bad Moon is one of the creepiest ones that are out there in Hollywood. Is it possible that somebody saw the same thing that I did and based their movie off of the description that they saw? makes you wonder what else is really out there, doesn't it? Did you know that if you keep talking about ghosts, the more active they are? Well, my roommates and I found out this the hard way, as you'll come to see. What you need to know about me is I come from a background of religious believers and I myself am one along with my roommates. 
We believe that there are in fact things on this earth we can't explain, along with an afterlife. So, a few years ago, I moved in with my roommate, Cassie. I moved in with her because her cousin at the time moved out and had to move back home to try and save money. I knew Cassie since I was a little girl, but we never got close until I moved in. A few nights after moving in, Cassie told me about the spirit that was attached to her cousin Abby. While I believed in things that I could not explain, the concept of a ghost attaching to someone seemed just a little bit far out there for me, but I respected her and listened anyway. Then she proceeded to tell me about these weird things that happened and how the strange occurrences in the house just stopped once Abby moved out. Well, fast forward a few months later and Abby moves back into our little condo. She wasn't getting along with her parents and she had to have a change of scenery. So she moved back in and these strange things just started to happen again. Strange noises or lights that would be on when we thought we'd turn them off. Nothing too noticeable at first, nothing malevolent, but just odd all the same. Now at the same time, we each had a dog and also shared a space with our indoor cat, so most of the time we would just blame those weird noises or occurrences on our animals. One night, Abby and I actually found ourselves alone on a cloudy fall night and got on the subject of our past ghostly encounters. We let the dogs outside for a while before the rain was supposed to roll in. And later on, Abby said her contacts had started getting uncomfortable and that she needed to go upstairs to take them out. Now our little condo had stairs right when you walked into the entryway. If you walked up the stairs, it was like a big square. You'd find my room to the right and you'd turn to the right again and there was a little bathroom that connected to my roommate's vanity area and then her room. Turn right again and you're at the back end of the hallway that connects to the stairs. I know all these details seem excessive, but it's important to know the layout of the house for the story to make sense. So as Abby walked up the stairs, I followed her, and we kept on talking about these paranormal experiences. I was standing in my doorway, and she was standing in the room opposite of me, fighting with her contact lenses. The wall to my left of the interior wall was my room, that had four mirrors hanging in a decorative square. And I can flat out tell you that there was no wind. There was no windows open, so there was no wind from outside. All the TVs were off. There was no way that any of this could have happened without some kind of ghostly interference. Abby was just finishing a story when all of a sudden, on the wall to my left, with enough force to actually knock all the mirrors crooked, was a bang, 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 right next to me in the center of my mirrors. We both looked wide-eyed at each other and bolted down the stairs with my friend screaming, I'm sorry, it's my fault, over and over. And she kept yelling, it's just my fault, it's all my fault. I was trying to comfort her, but I was terrified too. And I kept screaming, it's the cat, it's the damn cat, it can't be anything else, it has to be the cat. But I know full well that it wasn't that damn cat. And right when we got downstairs, just to prove my fears right, that cat was asleep in the armchair. How it stayed asleep through all the noise, I have no idea. But the two of us huddled on that couch for the rest of the night, both of us being too paranoid to sleep. A few weeks later, Cassie, Abby, and I were all talking about more weird experiences, which were happening almost daily now. And we got on the subject of where this ghost liked to reside most of the time. Abby told me that this thing that she would see would pace back and forth in my friend's vanity area, and especially liked my walk-in closet, which used to be Abby's old room. Now the thought of bunking up with a ghost terrified me, and I did my best not to think about it. But later on, as I thought more and more about it, I told whatever it was that it was welcome, since Abby did tell us that she thought it was benign in nature. But even though it's benign, that doesn't mean it didn't have a temper if provoked. And as if to prove my other point, a friend proved that theory a few weeks later when she came over to visit for the first time. This friend, who I will now mention, was a complete non-believer in the paranormal. She sometimes even liked to taunt the unseen, so out of respect for whatever it was that was living with us, I made her promise that she wouldn't try to provoke it. 
I told her not to say anything stupid or to taunt whatever it was. We were alone at the time. Abby and Cassie were out, and I didn't expect anyone home until late that evening, so I know that we were alone. Later on, I somehow found myself on the subject of weird activity in the house again, even though I knew that talking about it was just going to exasperate our condition. I was sitting on my bed, which was tucked in the far right corner of my room, and my friend was standing at the foot of my bed. About two feet behind her, I had a cabinet that was a little over six feet high. On that cabinet, I had several decorative figurines on the top of it, one of which was this rather heavy music box which had an angel figurine on the top of it. It was about six inches high and about four inches wide. That thing was not light by any means. The cabinet even had a ridge engraved on the top, and the angel figurine music box was about four inches behind that ridge. That figurine also had little legs on the bottom of it, making the following events extremely odd because it was impossible for that figurine to move like it did. So my friend started being a complete jackass and proceeded to try to piss off this spirit and actually said, if there's any ghost here, it can just kiss my ass. Right after she said this, that angel figurine flew off the top of the cabinet and hit her. It looked like it hit her in her back. We both just looked at each other with wide eyes and she bent over to pick it up to investigate it. When she did, this little wooden bird that I had on the cabinet flew off and hit her in the head. I guess just to make sure that she got the point that the ghost was pissed at her. We both got spooked, and that was proof enough to her that there really was something out there. And I'm telling you, this girl must have really pissed off whatever it was, because as I said goodbye and closed the front door, wham! All the cabinet doors in the kitchen slammed open and shut, and the light turned on. When that happened, let me tell you, I nearly shit my pants. I slowly went to investigate what happened, and I was apologizing for the actions of my dumbass friend. I quickly closed all the doors and ran upstairs, locking myself in my room until my roommates got home. My parents, who had heard these stories on almost a daily basis, were growing extremely concerned about how consumed my friends and I were by these experiences. They thought that maybe it was even the devil's work and they thought that trying to communicate with a ghost would lead to nothing good. They advised us that it would be best to leave the ghost stories and videos alone, at least until things settled down. I told my roommates about this, and we all agreed to leave the subject alone, just to see if the activity calmed down. For the remainder of our time in the condo and the time in the other house we moved into, we rarely ever discussed our past paranormal experiences. The activity ceased, and to this day, I rarely ever discuss my past paranormal experiences. I have fears that if I do, those things will manifest again. The advice my parents gave us worked for us, but to this day, I wonder, how did my parents find out about this trick themselves? This happened directly to me. At the time of the story, I was a 12-year-old male who lived in California. For a summer trip, me and my family flew to Boise, Idaho for a week to stay with my cousins. We stayed at their house for two days, and then came the best part. Well, it was the best part until what happened, that is. On the third day, we drove to a small city in the Rocky Mountains of central Idaho. They owned a cabin in Ketchum. The first day was fishing at nearby lakes, playing games, and meeting a few of the neighbors on the small street. Everyone we met was nice. It was amazing. I thought nothing could go wrong. Before I say more though, here's a layout of the area. The room where I slept was at the back of the house. There was no fence at the backyard because it was on the bank of a freezing cold river. Directly on the other side of the river, was a huge mountain covered by a thick forest of pine trees. A small path that starts on the other side of the river, but no bridge. And there's a quarter mile path down the road in front of our house. So that night I went to bed 
and woke up at 2 a.m. needing to use the bathroom. I got up and did my thing, then headed back to my room. As I got into bed, I felt hot, so I opened my window. But not 15 minutes after, I heard the most terrifying screech come from the forest. It was raspy, but high-pitched. I know for a fact it wasn't human. I've heard stories from horror narration YouTube channels like yours that often describe the creatures that make these weird noises that sort of sound human, but aren't. I heard it once more, but this time a lot closer. So I shut my window and went to bed hoping that whatever it was would just go on its way. In the morning I woke up and we explored around town. At 7 p.m., me, my sister, and my cousins got permission from our parents to go explore the forest. Now, I wanted to do this, but I was uneasy, considering that I'd heard that creepy human-like noise the night before, and now it was nearing night again. My oldest cousin, Alex, who was 16 at the time, actually had a loaded pistol, a lighter, and a backpack of snacks. I carried a hunting knife and a flashlight. My cousin that was my age, Julia, just took a flashlight. My sister Brianna and her other cousin Karina, who were 10 at the time, took some extra batteries and a small bag of candy each. We made our way across the bridge at the end of the street and back to the path on the side of the river across from our house. All of us began the hike at the top of the mountain. We made it to the top of Bald Mountain in an hour and a half. The view from 9,000 feet was incredible. I'd never seen anything like that in California. At 8.55, Alex and I figured it was time to head down and ordered our little group of family members to the path. At this point, it was dark now, and the sun had fully set. Julia and I turned on our flashlights and shined them ahead as we walked. Some halfway down the mountain, which was about 45 minutes into the walk, I got that dreadful feeling you get when you know you're being watched and followed. I just knew that something out there was watching us and it wasn't something or someone that was friendly. It was that sense you get when there's a predator around. And then seconds later, that something was hiding in the bushes just a few yards into the tree line that bordered the path and then it ran off to our right. We all heard it. It was large and loud. I brushed it off though as some kind of animal and that was about five minutes after the incident because for the first five minutes all we could do was freak out. What we heard made me tingle with fear and my heart drop into my stomach. And then, just to make matters worse, that same horrifying screech from last night echoed through the forest from a mile or two away. I told everyone we needed to move faster, that we needed to get out of the forest because something was out there that maybe wanted to hurt us, and we all started to move with haste. That horrible scream went off again, but just like the night before, it sounded a lot closer. This thing could cover distance very quickly. And then again, it went off, and it was even closer. Whatever that thing was, it was moving faster than we could. We were just short of breaking into a run at this point, walking fast enough to move, but slow enough to where we wouldn't run into any trees or downed logs in the dark. But still, that wasn't fast enough because soon that screeching stopped and we heard loud footsteps about 30 yards off to the right. I got that dreadful feeling of being watched again Alex took his gun out and fired two shots in the general direction of that creature, and it seemed to back off. But even though we thought it was gone, I still sensed we were being watched by it from the shadows. Finally, the river came into sight, but it caught me and everyone else by surprise, because I heard the path gravel crunching behind us. I looked back into the darkness and saw the outline of something that resembled a human on the path behind us about 200 yards in the distance. But this was no human, because it was just too large to be a person. I told Alex to look back, and when he did, his face went pale. We told the rest of our group to quietly run on the count of three. 
and when we hit three, we all broke out into a run towards the river. Whatever that thing was, was definitely extremely fast. When we reached the river, there wasn't even time to get to the bridge a quarter of a mile further along that river because this thing was catching up fast. We jumped in and swam across that cold, icy water. This thing got to the river just as we made it up the bank and into the backyard. Foolishly, we shined our flashlights over and finally got a good look at that thing. I wish to this day that we had just run into the house and ignored what was chasing us. Because this thing was massive. It was this giant, hairy creature that was about seven feet tall. And it was nothing that's ever been discovered on this earth. It had huge, razor-sharp claws like a bear. Its eyes glowed red when the flashlight shined on them. Again, Alex took a shot at it, and this thing darted off with one final screech. And we realized just how fast this thing was, because it was gone in the blink of an eye. We all looked at each other in pure terror. We were all shocked and in surprise. Alex tried to explain everything to our parents, but they didn't know what to make of it, and they'd never heard of anything like it. I'm thankful nothing happened to us, and that I noticed this creature was behind us. If I hadn't, one of the others might not have noticed it until it was too late. The next time I stay at that cabin, I'm not going into those woods alone at night. Hell, I might not go into those woods at all. If I had to guess what this creature was based off of what I saw, it had to have been a werewolf. I know they're not supposed to exist, but what else could it have been? In the late summer of 2017 began a strange phase in my life that led to a sequence of paranormal events that haunt me to this day and will probably haunt me forever. From about August to October is the timeline for these events. I started watching these videos on YouTube about stupid 3 a.m. challenges, knowing that most of them are fake. However, a few really did intrigue me. One known as the closet game especially and the use of the Ouija board. In my garage, I played the closet game. There was this little room inside the garage that worked perfectly. Nothing ever seemed to happen, but I do recall always getting bad vibes from that room ever since then. I started playing with a Ouija board first with friends. Then I started playing it alone to see if it would work. I know you're never supposed to play with these things alone, but I still did it. I played so often talking to many different entities. Eventually, I started talking to something called Zozo. I knew Zozo was bad from the get-go. I've seen all about him on YouTube, and I read up extensively on my own, doing my own research on what the name was based from and why they use it. I say they because I believe that Zozo is not a real name. I believe it's a trick name that bad spirits use to gain power. I eventually became obsessed with the board and Zozo, speaking to him almost every day and night, just casually laughing as he threatened me, knowing that he really couldn't do much. That's what I thought at least. However, I started to notice some changes. One night, I decided to play the Ouija board in the room I played in the closet game. After all, it did give me bad vibes. So being the idiot that I am, decided sure, as I played alone in this room by myself, there sat an old TV that wasn't plugged in. I could see my own reflection somewhat cloudy in the TV, but it was easy to make out features of myself. I began to play the board, and as always, Zozo appeared. Whenever I would want to talk to him, I never had fear, and I knew that he was a demon. I believe he knew that I knew this, and the fact that I was still talking to him made him somewhat calmer. He was always very calm with me, and when I would ask questions, he would respond respectfully. Me and him would tease each other often. I'd ask him where he was sitting, and the planchette pointed directly in front of me, where the TV was. I asked if he could do something, some way, to show himself to me, and he moved swiftly to yes. 
I quickly asked what he was going to do, and the planchette moved to the center of the board and forward. I didn't understand it at first, but I realized he was pointing. I looked up at the TV and watched in a combination of horror, disbelief, and awe as my reflection began to morph into a horrific creature. It somewhat still held some of my features, like my hair and clothes. However, the eyes went pitch black, looking like holes. It was like staring into a deep abyss. The eyes were not just circular. They seemed like they were dripping almost, like the darkness was slowly dripping down and out of the reflection of the eyes. The mouth was hilariously enough exactly like the scream mask. It looked absolutely horrific, but at the same time, cliche. So I'm not sure if this was genuinely an experience or not, but it was still very interesting to say the least. And I really don't think based off of everything else that happened later, that it was my imagination playing on me. On another day, my friend came over and the two of us were smoking in my garage. I know again that you're never supposed to play the Ouija board in an altered state of mind, but at this point, I didn't know that Zozo had influence over me. I go to play the board, asking if my friend wanted to join. He politely refused, and I played alone, again talking with Zozo. I got bored, of course, as I always talk to Zozo, and decided to just put the board away. I got out my box of knives and started showing my friend my collection. But we both started feeling this weird energy in the air, like static. You know when you feel static electricity pulling your hair towards it? It was like that, but everywhere. Like the whole room was just full of static electricity. I thought it was just me, so funnily went to touch my friend to shock him. However, it didn't work. He was also feeling this static energy, and as quick as it went, it seemed to vanish. I started spacing out after this. Apparently, I grabbed one of my knives and very slowly put it to my neck and started leaning my head on it, as if I was about to slice my own throat. When I came to, I felt the knife pressed against my neck and was confused, my friend not paying attention and on the computer. At that moment, I knew immediately that I could no longer play with the board, because it was like something else had taken over my body. I promised myself that I would never play it again and put it away in my closet. About three times a week, I would find myself unaware of reaching for the board, even though I promised that I would never play it again. This is when I realized that I might be under some kind of demonic influence. I've since cleaned myself of this, and I'm okay now, but there's still one more story to share. One night, I was sneaking out of my house and went to hop the gate that leads into the alley so I could get out of my backyard. Once I hopped the gate, I started walking out of the alley when I extremely and distinctly heard in a loud whisper, come back, in a sinister tone. I screamed like a scared little girl and ran to my car to get the hell out of there. And the same night, once I got home, at around 3 a.m., I decided to open my third eye in the bathroom. A lot of people have their own opinions about whether it works or not, and I'm fully aware that people have their doubts, and that's okay because I didn't believe it at first either, but it does work. I was opening my third eye, and right when I felt the energy, very furiously, I felt this tingling in my forehead as it opened. And then I heard what I can only describe as a demonic laugh. Three little laughs that sounded like they were from a horrific creature. I ran out of that bathroom, and I felt this malicious energy behind me. I ran to my room and closed my eyes and prayed so hard to ask God for forgiveness because I did something that I shouldn't have, and I asked him for help. Immediately, I felt those horrible energies dissipate. I haven't dabbled in the paranormal at all since then, but I still have odd occurrences here and there. I'm just scared that whatever this thing is, it's going to follow me for the rest of my life because I was foolish enough to mess with a Ouija board and speak with something that calls itself Zozo. The goat man is real. I could tell you that because when I was a boy, I saw it with my own two eyes. 
My grandma, my dad's mom, was full-blooded Apache native, and my dad took that pretty seriously. I learned about the woods and nature at a pretty young age. We were always out in the woods, hunting or hiking, or just going out there and enjoying each other's company. My dad was a single parent. I guess my mom just didn't really want anything to do with me, so it was just the two of us. We were, and still are, best buds. One day, while we were out in the woods in Kentucky, we separated by going off in two different directions. My dad was adamant that I learned to find my own way around the woods, in case I ever got lost. He was also in the process of teaching me how to track animals, which I thought was the coolest thing any dad could teach his son. After walking in opposite directions, for at least five minutes, I was ready to turn around and see what I had heard, and learned. As I surveyed my surroundings, I started hearing my dad calling my name. Stuart! Stuart! I was a little annoyed because I was really excited to show him all the things that he was teaching me were actually working, that they were paying off. I wanted to show him that he was a good teacher. So needless to say, I was a little bit annoyed. And then the voice got closer and closer and finally I sighed and called out to him that I was over here, Dad. Come to my voice, he called back to me. I sighed again and went in the direction he was calling me from, still annoyed. All of a sudden, my dad burst into view, running like a bat out of hell. But what was weird about the whole situation is I could have sworn he was calling me from the opposite direction that he was coming from. He was running full speed, and he yelled, we have to get out of these woods right now. He barked at me and grabbed me by the hand. He took off full speed again, and I ran as fast as I could to keep up with him. Keep in mind, I was 13 at the time, and only 5'2". He was a full-grown man that was in great shape, and he was 6 feet tall. I had a hell of a time keeping up with him. Keep running, he told me. And it was the first time, and the only time, I've ever seen that man afraid. I tried to ask what was wrong, but I was too out of breath and couldn't get the words out. He was still dragging me by my upper arm when I figured out for myself just what it was that he was afraid of. Because I looked back. I heard noises like hooves racing after us. I needed to know what it was that was back there. I still ask myself to this day, why in the hell did you have to look back, Stuart? I shouldn't have looked back. Because coming up on us very quickly was the ugliest thing I've ever seen. It was covered in this dark, coarse, curly hair all over its body. The hair was thinner on its chest, and I could see skin, but the arms and legs were so hairy I couldn't see anything underneath. The fur was matted and muddy almost like dreadlocks in some places, especially around the hips and shoulders. It had backwards legs like a ram or goat, and this thing had frigging hooves. Yes, hooves that it was running on, but it was a biped. The head was very hairy too, except for the face. It was this fuzzy, coarse hair, but not as hairy like the arms. It had a wide mouth, and it was smiling this evil-looking smile. I saw jagged teeth, some of them sharp, some of them looked broken, and it had actual horns coming out the top sides of its head. Horns that curled back like a ram. I actually screamed when I saw it. Not so manly, I know, but I don't think my dad cared. Because what I looked at that day before I figured out what a goat man was. I thought it was the devil. My dad never looked back. He just kept running and dragging me along with him. As we were running, you could still hear this thing chasing after us. Its footsteps were loud and heavy. I could hear the hooves hit the ground as it chased after us. My lungs were burning. I was terrified but I had no intentions whatsoever of slowing down. I don't think my dad would have let me anyways. If I had stopped, he probably would have just thrown me over his shoulder and got the hell out of there. And then this thing 
that goat man let out this hoarse laughter that was the ugliest thing I've ever heard in my life. It was ugly and evil. This thing was actually laughing at us. It was enjoying this chase, enjoying the fear that was radiating off of us. And I knew that it was going to enjoy tearing us apart if it caught up to us. But after what felt like forever, the laughing and the running stopped and this thing was just gone. I looked back again and didn't see anything behind us. It had just disappeared. I wondered why it stopped chasing us as we kept running and finally, finally, we made it back to my dad's truck. The whole chase only lasted a few minutes, but it was enough to scare us for life. The whole drive home, which was about an hour and 15 minutes, we didn't say much. I was trying to be a tough guy like my dad. I looked over at him and I knew he was scared. He was still shock white and his hands were gripping the steering wheel tightly. We ended up making that hour and 15 minute drive in less than an hour. When we got home, we just sat in the car for a long time. We looked at each other knowing how scary the sighting was and how close to being killed we might have actually been. And then my dad, in just a little more than a whisper, choked out, that wasn't me calling you in the woods, son. He almost choked up when he said it. When he did, my head just started spinning. It sounded exactly like my dad. I couldn't say anything after that. I just stared at him, feeling sick to my stomach. I heard it call to you, and I knew that it wanted you to come to it. I've never been more scared in my entire life thinking that it was going to take you away from me. I'll never forget those words. I knew my dad loved me. Of course he did. He was my dad. But that day, I realized just how much he loved me. This man that had never been scared of anything in his life was terrified that I was going to be taken away from him. I finally found my voice and asked what it was. He shook his head. I don't know. But you know as well as I do that the forest is full of spirits, and maybe this was one of them. We never went back into that part of the forest again. Until I was an adult. We couldn't find the exact spot where we were. I think our minds blocked it out to keep us safe. And I wasn't exactly thrilled to go back to the area. But I just felt like we needed to, for closure. Luckily, nothing happened. I truly think that if it wanted to, it could have caught up with us. It could have killed us. Nobody ever would have known. This thing is just playing with us. I read somewhere on the internet that they like to scare people and that they get off on the fear they cause. Believe me, the fear was real. And it did enjoy what it did to us. Over the years, I've come to believe that we witnessed a goat man. It looked almost exactly like a satyr. You know, the ones from Greek mythology. I've seen pictures on the internet and in books that I've read. It's got to be something like that. What else could it be? One thing's for sure. It has the capability to mimic voices. So I wonder, what else does it have the power to do? This story is admittedly kind of unbelievable, so please just bear with me. I've had a lot of weird things happen throughout my life. I always chalked it up to being naturally in the wrong place at the wrong time and having bad luck with paranormal stuff. But I also have a kind of thrill-seeking attitude, so that's where this story starts. I know this is going to sound like I'm making it up, or worse, that I'm crazy, but I need to know what the hell it was that I saw. 
I'm sure some of you have heard of Stoll, Kansas. If not, it's believed to be one of the gateways to hell, as well as being the birthplace of Satan's son, among other stuff, like being cultists that live there or Satan worshippers in the town. This town was only about a three and a half hour drive from where I lived at the time, and I'd been wanting to visit for a while. So, one night, I got a wild hair up my ass and decided to go with my now ex. We'd had both done some research and heard about how people in the area can be violent, so we each had a pocket knife on us, as well as a sword in the back seat. I know, a sword seems over the top, but a lot of people have been shot at in the area. Things were already weird while driving up there. The roads would disappear when we got closer to the town, and other vehicles were seemingly trying to drive us off the road. The closer we got to the town, after two toll stations and stopping for gas to be sure we didn't run out, the more creepy this place felt. The road would just completely drop off in front of us, and all we could see was the grassy hills and trees around us. I was the one driving because my ex doesn't drive. There were a few times where other vehicles would get right up behind us, to the point I couldn't see because the headlights were bouncing off the mirrors. The first time we tried to stop, we completely missed the town because literally the only thing you could see from this road was a church, one small house, and a graveyard, as if not to make things creepy already. It wasn't until we actually passed it that I realized that was Stull, and I almost couldn't turn around at an intersection because the truck behind us wouldn't slow down or even go around us when I began to brake. We turned around eventually and got to the cemetery, only to realize that the gate was locked with a no trespassing sign posted on it. So we decided just to leave. An important thing to note is that the roads in this area are super curvy and twist a lot. Both of us got this gut feeling like we shouldn't be there, so we decided to turn around and just leave. The time was 11.34 when we turned around, about four hours after we had left our house. We took one turn down a dirt road to get back, and I panicked because I swore I saw a kid run out in front of the car. I was driving an old 88 Lincoln, so it was pure steel and surely would have killed anyone that was in the way, especially the way this kid seemingly went underneath the car. I didn't feel any bumps, and when I screamed asking where he went, my ex was completely confused. She didn't see anyone at all, and reassured me that I hadn't just hit a person. Sure as hell, when I pulled over, there wasn't anything in the road behind us, and there definitely wasn't anything caught underneath the car. So, I'm pretty sure I saw the ghost of something run in front of the car, and that my ex wasn't privy to this encounter. But still, that's not even the weirdest part. I began keeping track of the turns when we were driving out there. I wanted to know the curves and all of the road because I didn't want to get lost in this unfamiliar hillbilly backwoods area. I knew I had at least two more turns before I'd be back facing the direction of Stull, especially because this dirt road was straight compared to the curved but consistently southeast road that we'd been on. I reached the end of that road and was literally right beside the town. So I go to pull up near the cemetery again, but a large truck was behind me and wouldn't let me slow down at all, just like the last time. Like, they almost rammed me when my accelerator just stopped. Literally, in the middle of the road, no matter how hard I pushed the gas pedal, my accelerator just stopped. So now we're throwing in mechanical failure, along with this sighting that I had of a ghost. I was looking in the side mirror when my eye caught something, and I looked up to my left. There was what I would have mistaken for a naked person, if it weren't for its arms and hands. This thing was crouched on the shoulder of the road, with its face buried behind its knees, like it was trying to hide its face or something. It was malnourished looking, skinny to the point of appearing to be skin on bone. Its arms were unnatural. From a crouching position, its upper arms were long enough that its forearms rested entirely on the ground beside it. Its hands were abnormally long too, with dark nails. Its skin was gray. I could tell that even with the yellow glow from my headlights. My hair stood on end. My heart felt like it stopped for a moment. I couldn't breathe looking at this thing. I immediately asked my ex if she saw it, but she'd been looking behind us at that pickup truck. The truck went around us when I didn't speed up, and that's when I noticed it wasn't a truck. It was a white van with government tags and stickers. 
You know the kind. Not police stickers, but county officials. It drove past us, damn near clipping our front bumper when they merged back into our lane. It wasn't until we were back past the town that my accelerator actually started working again. Thankfully, because I was worried we'd break down more than three hours from home with an almost dead cell phone. My ex's cell phone was dead because she'd been using Google Maps the whole time, and mine was maybe at 25% because the maps had drained my battery too. We ended up getting back on the interstate to head back down towards Wichita when my ex checked the directions to be sure. It was 1.07 a.m., which didn't make sense to either of us because it certainly hadn't been like an hour and a half since we last checked it. We'd only been driving around for maybe another 40 minutes at most. It was at this point I explained to my ex what I saw, and she didn't know what it could be. The rest of the trip home is unimportant, but for months after, I had nightmares about this thing. To this day, which is about three years later, I still think I see it sometimes, and still have nightmares when I think I see it. I still get glances where I swear I could see it in stark contrast to the dark. Its arms were so freakishly long. I've tried having my arms rest the way this things were, and just can't. Its upper arms must have been at least two, two and a half feet long with the way that this thing was positioned. I didn't see its face, which is what my older brother asked when I talked about it, because he claimed to have seen something similar but smaller. The thing he saw, though, had red eyes, and when he talked to an ex-priest, he said it was some kind of Native American demon or some shit, which I don't believe is what I saw. Its skin was light gray, like dried cement. Based on how it was hunched over while crouching, I didn't see its height, but... I can assume that it was tall. Whatever it was wasn't natural, and it certainly wasn't a person. Does anyone know what I saw? It still messes with me almost three years later, and I can't help but feel like it followed me home. For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups of four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, so we started looking up some lesser known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was a thing known as the Not Deer, also known as the Night Deer in some cases. According to people's stories, it looked almost like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. Only when they drove away did they realize what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. Quoting someone else's personal account, it was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found out it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away from me. Just about every written or publicized story of the not deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina and its surrounding areas. I informed the group that I discovered this, and being a spontaneous person, I also told them that I'd be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious, but I still wanted to go. At the very least, it was something interesting to do, right? And I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambience of the area to the main screenwriter. I wasn't able to convince the other three members of my group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons they couldn't go, and since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I had been itching for some more travel ever since the entire pandemic thing started. I filled my roommate in on what I was doing and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me he would just consider it, but as I was getting ready to go on my investigation, he told me he decided to tag along. One of his main reasons being he felt like he had to go with me to keep me safe. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS and we headed out. 
My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and on the CD player, and had some of whatever snacks that we bought earlier. Eventually, though, we got close to Boone, and that's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us want to turn around or anything like that, but it was just worth mentioning to each other, considering what it was that we were going out there to do. When we got into the city, it was just about what we had imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, small cafes. All of them looked like they were closed at the time, with the time of travel and arrival in Boone being about 9:10 p.m. But all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me we should probably head back around 9.30 and that he would let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say though, we didn't come across anything by 9.30 and he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock on my dash of my car had been broken for a while and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned that fact and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good or bad thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. That's when things started to get bad. At this point, we rarely came across any other cars on the highway. We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This means there are lots of tall, dark trees, almost no street lights, and twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still though, there was nowhere to turn around, so we just continued going straight since that was really the only option we had for the time being. A few different times, we got this serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of road. There were a couple of times that both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because something just felt so wrong, like we should not be there, like this place was just evil or wrong and we needed to get out of there as soon as we could. The feeling of dread was very particular too. It wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety, but the best way to describe it is a sense of wrongness and it seemed to come in waves not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely either. By this point, even my GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and mine said they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily though, his GPS still worked fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down the road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we'd come across the exact area where you'd expect a monster to show up. And we started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we'd felt so far. But we knew something wasn't right. We both felt like we weren't supposed to be there. We felt like we needed to get out of there. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, that put me on edge even more since he never gets scared of anything. There wasn't much we could do about it though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came though, and it went with every other segment of road that we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn around. My roommate told me, turn right on that road. I knew he meant turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason, I figured we should just turn around and backtrack. I started slowing down, but we both started feeling seriously bad, like things were very wrong and something was about to happen bad. It was worse than we had felt the entire trip so far. My roommate said my eyes actually glazed over like I was in a trance or something, and I just kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here. I just need to turn around right here. Over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got until it was almost a whisper. Keep in mind, I'm normally a very loud person, and I'd been loud the entire drive up to this point. But whatever it was that came over me or whatever trance I was in was seriously affecting my personality. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road, 
Along that gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with our headlights on, it was difficult to see very far ahead. Then he said, very forcefully, that we couldn't stop and we needed to keep going because he felt seriously bad. But I wasn't listening to him, and I don't even remember him saying that. I wasn't quite processing what he was saying, and for some reason, I was having difficulty hearing him at all. After he realized he wasn't getting through to me, he broke into a literal shout and told me we had to get out of there because we could not stop and we could not go back the way we came. It actually ended up with him using his road rage yell to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we'd gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. It was like that terror either possessed me or there was something that was out in those fields and those trees that came over me and put me in that kind of trance. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, that looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got onto the main highway, we felt safe again. But in the moment that I pulled off onto that gravel dip of road where I had almost stopped the car entirely, that was the most terrifying experience that I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from that spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was though, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say that even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for. Is it possible that there's creatures out there that can cause that sense of dread and even make you go into a trance like I was in? It's scary to think about that kind of stuff because what if it put you in a trance and had you get out of the car or stop the car? Would I even be here telling you that story if I did stop the car completely? My parents moved from Ireland to Middle England in the early 1990s. The house that they bought was built in the early 1900s. It was a pretty Gregorian, it was semi-detached, and next door, which used to be part of the garden, were an older couple. They lived there and we became very close to them. We actually considered them family, basically some surrogate grandparents if you will. The woman's name was Maggie and she actually grew up in our house. They built their house on what was once the garden in ours to look after her aging mother. Her mother was a wealthy woman. They had a live-in maid and would have been considered quite upper class back in the day. But unfortunately, her children were all ailing in some way. Her eldest boy died at four. Maggie had diabetes and in fact was actually one of the first people to ever receive insulin, which saved her life in her late teens. The youngest boy was very disabled, physically challenging and nonverbal. Maggie's husband, who we called Grandpa Jay, thought that the little brother may have had some sort of locked-in syndrome with quite a lot of intellectual gifts beneath the inability to communicate. In 2011, after working far too hard in my early 20s in my first job after university, I felt completely burnt out. Six years of intense high-level schooling and then a 60-hour work week? No thanks. I moved back for a bit just to take a breather while finding another job. Three weeks in of me being there, Granddad Jay's brother-in-law died. He would have been in his early 90s at the time. All of this paranormal activity began within days of the brother-in-law's death. First of all, we just had this kind of eerie feeling, like I was being watched. And I remember wondering if I'd developed some kind of anxiety problem, as I had suffered panic attacks for a brief spell in my teens. But then came the scratching. We never had a bird or mouse problem before. I asked my parents if we should have a pest control come over and check the walls of the house. They said it only been quite recently, so we should wait a while. Maybe it was some roosting pigeons nestling the last weeks of their fledglings. But then came a kind of tapping, or a rapping sound. 
almost like someone was gently knocking from within the bricks of the house. I became so used to strange sounds around me that I lost all interest in trying to find the source. Usually, taps, knocks, and bangs were all accounted for. I presumed maybe old pipes had become unsecured or the next door had rats. But I also ignored the fact that we lived in a house for 20 years and had nothing of these problems before. One morning, I woke with a start. It was dusk, about 5 a.m. The old TV that sat abandoned for six years in a corner in my brother's old room, where I was sleeping, was clicking madly. The walls were scratching. The knocking was in a frenzy. Even though the heating was off and it was summer, I knew no pipes could have been causing it. I stared around for a few seconds, completely in terror and shock, and realized almost instantly that this was paranormal energy that I was feeling. When I say the energy was frenzied, I mean it. It was like a quietish cacophony. I filmed it with my old phone. I have it on my laptop somewhere. People used to tell me, you can't film that shit. That's why ghosts don't exist. Well, guess what? You can. I know nothing about the paranormal. I used to piss myself laughing at horror films. So why would paranormal activity just come into my head so strongly and completely if that's not what it was? I just found that odd. This went on for a few days and I mentioned it to my mom. She laughed it off. My mom is an accountant and a super intelligent and practical person. She's where unnecessary drama goes to die. I googled it and found an article. But what was creepy about it, and still scares me to this day, was that it was textbook what was happening to me. The scratches, the tappings, how it seemed to be getting louder, and how the sounds began to feel intentional. Like three obvious knocks, rather than just tapping. So human. So intelligent. Also, I never felt fear like that. I could have a wonderful evening laughing with friends. They go home, I go up to bed feeling so warm and wonderful, and then I awake, unlike anything I've ever felt before. Always somewhere between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. The most unbelievable sense of dread. That frankly did not feel like it came from me. I mean, it feels like it came from another source. And then the nightmares started to come. I felt like the more I thought about it, the more it would feed off my energy. Like there was a legit psychological level up to all of this. That was the worst part about all of it. The nightmares were always the same. I woke up, only I couldn't move, like sleep paralysis. And there was a dark presence in the room, sometimes in the form of a shadow in the corner. It was like a large male shadow and the most ominous feeling I've ever felt. Terror and danger unlike anything I could have ever imagined. I had never and have never had nightmares before or since, except maybe those odd small ones that everybody gets. I haven't had any experience like it since, actually. Typing about it even spooks me out because I feel like the energy you let in is whatever this thing feeds on. Despite this, though, I chalked it all up to anxiety and told Mum I was no longer sleeping in that room. She told me she'd swap, so I went out on the sofa. The next few days were fine and peaceful, until Mum came down one morning, completely ashen-faced. I asked if she was okay. She described getting sleep paralysis, even though she didn't know what it was. This was the first time she'd ever experienced anything like that in her life, may I add. She described my experience. The male shadow figure, in the same corner, with the same feeling, and mind you, I hadn't told her about all of this. Grandpa Jay's brother-in-law was over six feet, by the way, so I get the distinct impression it could have been him. He was an angry, tortured soul, and that room was Maggie's old room. Mum also had that classic incubus encounter thing going on, too. I didn't have that experience. When I told her to Google it, it looked like it was the real thing. She was horrified by how similar her experiences were to others because she'd never heard about this either. Things only got worse from there. Whatever this thing was grew angrier and angrier. Every night, just as you were about to drift into sleep, literally, that second of losing consciousness, there would be a huge bang on the headboard, like the whole strength of an incredibly strong man, and it would wrench you from your sleep. 
This was happening in every single room now. We all started to get insomnia. Not sleeping for the best part of three months is shit, let me tell you that. I was getting really fed up, and I was a nervous wreck. I decided I had to move out. But before I did, I called the carbon monoxide person to check for leaks. Maybe it was paranoia. When he came out, there wasn't any. A week before I moved out, things started happening in the day, and even my father, who had angrily shut down all of this repeatedly, agreed to finally get some spiritual help, maybe even a priest. My dad is more stubborn than an ocean of mules and hates anything remotely dramatic or whimsical. He's a working class Irish man and a scientist, through and through. He deeply resents the magical thinking of anybody that brings it up. But now even he believes something else was going on. The night we decided on that, I woke up with one of those huge bangs, only to find my books all over the floor. I finally had evidence to show my parents, and they couldn't deny that. I sure as hell didn't throw them. I couldn't have. I didn't leave my bed. I screamed, and they came in. They would have heard it if I left my bed. The last few days included audible growls. I even tried recording some. We got incredibly strong smells of male sweat mixed with some kind of ammonia. And my sister, who was now visiting too, started screaming and almost ran right over to the neighbor's house because when I was explaining how the knock seemed intentional, like sometimes one, two, three, as soon as I finished saying three, there were three very loud, intentional knocks on the door right next to us. I heard my name whispered so many times. Whatever this thing was wanted us to know that it was hearing us. Mum even said she had the feeling of being pushed across the landing against a wall in the middle of the day. I left. Mum went to church for the first time in 20 years. She only went a few times, but she said it actually helped. I came back to visit three months later. One morning, when I heard my mom come down for breakfast, I turned to her, and we both just said, It's gone. At the same time, it was like we both felt this relief. Like I said, I never had any experience before or since like this. Me, or anyone else in my family. It was just for that few months of terror. Never even a bad nightmare in the ten years since then. I now have this theory that humans are monumentally egotistical when it comes to thinking that the universe begins and ends within the realm of our five limited senses. It's not completely unfeasible to me to think that there are sentient beings or entities or maybe even animals that we just can't easily detect. So do I believe? No, not resolutely, because it was only one period of time in my life and it was fairly short and contained. But do I now keep a very open mind where I once left it off? Absolutely. My dad denied it ever happened, but mom and I aren't so foolish. For anyone who may be scared, I moved back to this house four years later and I'm still there actually. It remains one of the most lovely and homey feelings that I've ever had. This place does not have that ominous feeling anymore. It was like Grandpa Jay's brother-in-law just got up and left one day. I've never experienced anything like it since. Nothing's bad forever. Have a good night. Back when I was 18, my friends and I decided to go on a trip to some rural area to relax on our own for a couple of days. Luckily, my late grandparents owned a medium-sized house in a remote village. There are plenty of those where I come from. So I got the keys for my dad and we packed food, water, and a first aid kit and headed out there. It was a two hour ride from the closest city to get there. The car dropped us off in the middle of nowhere and told us to walk in a straight line until we got to the village. After about 30 minutes of walking, we reached our destination and it was nothing fancy. Just a village that was definitely bigger than expected though. There were dogs, chickens, and goats roaming around freely. I was a city boy, so that sight was a first for me. We got to my grandparents' house and settled in. We spent the first day resting and decided to go to a spot that my father told me about in the morning. 
We headed out that way at daybreak. We packed plenty of water. The spot was close by, so we didn't think to pack any food, though. After about a 30-minute walk in the middle of a heavy wooded mountain, we finally got to our destination. It was a beautiful area. There were these huge trees, an amazing view. One tree was exceptionally large, and I admired it for a while. But still, it wasn't enough for the five young idiots who came there to explore. So we kept moving forward, just looking around and having fun. But without realizing it, we'd spent an extra hour and a half up there. We were exhausted, and more importantly, hungry. So we decided to head back. We followed the trail back, but we never reached that gigantic tree, even after an hour of fast walking. We began to panic and went from walking fast to jogging. But for some reason, even though we should have been backtracking, we didn't make it to the tree. We were officially lost. And that's when we spotted an old lady walking the trail. We quickly approached her and said hello and asked how close to the village we were. She looked at us weirdly and told us we were walking the opposite way and the village was like a three hour walk in the opposite direction. This was bad news for us. We were already exhausted by that point. Three of us could barely stand, let alone walk for another three hours. We explained to the old woman about our situation. She offered us a place to rest as her place was close by and she also offered us a meal. That way we could get some energy for our walk home. I didn't think that it was a good idea to follow a stranger even though we were in a rough situation and one of my friends, Adam, protested along with me. But between the hunger and the state of the others, we gave in and agreed to follow the woman. We followed her towards her cabin. It was small with a tiny garden in front of it and a goat tied to a post next to the door. Overall, it was nothing out of the ordinary in these parts of the country. We went in and sat down on these long sofas with no back support. She told us to wait while she got out some food. The cabin was very clean. The tables, chairs, and sofa were obviously old and worn out, but not dusty, and overall the place looked very welcoming. However, Adam and I didn't fully drop our guard while the others were simply happy that they had something to sit on. Fifteen minutes later, she came out from the kitchen with two big plates of chicken and vegetables, a plate of salad, and some olive oil. She poured us tea, and we dug in as she went back to the kitchen to prepare more. I was considering not eating, but my hunger took over me, and I went right in as soon as the plates hit the table, just like our other friends. Except Adam. He didn't lay one single finger on the food, nor the tea, and he was very paranoid. But he was also the most in shape of all of us, so he managed to hold back on his hunger. The old lady ended up bringing two more plates of food out that we cleaned up. She brought more tea and told us to rest and digest the food and leave whenever we felt like it. She then excused herself and went to her room to sleep, as she was tired from cooking. We drifted off to sleep one by one, and I set up an alarm to ring in 30 minutes so we could move on. I was the last one to actually drift off to sleep and was talking to Adam before I did. He said he was going to stay awake and just keep an eye on us for a bit before we got moving. The next thing I knew, I was being shaken awake by my friends, who all looked very worried. I snapped awake when I saw their faces and looked around, asking them what was going on. One of them pointed to the window and told me to look outside. I didn't get it at first, but then I noticed. It was sunrise. I almost had a heart attack. I thought we overslept for a whole day, but it was worse. Adam was nowhere to be found. We went out of the cabin and called, but there was no answer. So we went back in to ask the old lady if she had seen him. I knocked on the door to the room but I didn't get a response. I checked the door and realized it wasn't locked, so I decided to excuse myself in, and when I did, it was the first time since I went on this trip that I was in full panic mode. There was no bed in that room. In fact, there was nothing, like nothing at all, just four walls and a door. We went into the kitchen and it was the same way as well. How the hell could she have cooked all of that food if there wasn't even a refrigerator or a stove? I ran to my phone to try to call Adam. The signal there was weak. I knew that from the last time I checked my phone, but when I grabbed it, it was off. Dead battery. I know it was around 70% when I went to sleep. All of our phones were dead, actually. So we got out of the house and started running on the trail towards the village while calling Adam's name over and over. After a while, 
we met some people from the village and they were actually my grandparents' neighbors. They looked almost scared when they saw us. Then they dropped this bomb on us all. Where were you these past three days? I looked at them in shock and then they elaborated for me. All of us were missing for three days. My parents were freaking out because they didn't answer the phone. They called everybody, including these neighbors, to ask if they'd seen me or any of my friends. They even reported us all missing. The whole village was looking for us for two days. We asked for help finding Adam, but after we told them what happened, they took us to the local mosque and the imam could look into it for us. They believed it was witchcraft. We went back there the next day with some men from the village looking for Adam. We showed them the cabin and its surroundings. We looked for hours on end, but there was no sign of him anywhere. We gave up when the police took over, but even they couldn't find much. To this day, I still wonder what happened. I am religious, but I can't accept that this woman was a witch. Even if she was, why only Adam? Why did he disappear? Why not all of us? Was it because he didn't eat any of the food? Or because he went snooping around the cabin? Part of me wants to go back there so I can uncover the truth, but every time I think about this incident, I get this crippling fear of that damn cabin, and I can't force myself to go back. Adam is still missing. Nobody knows what happened to him. His body was never found in those woods. We have no answers for his family. There's no trace that he was ever out there. Neither him nor that witch were ever seen again. I'm a crafty person. I don't mean crafty like clever or cunning. I mean, I like to make crafts with pressed flowers and dried leaves. Some people may think making crafts is a waste of time, but personally, I find it very relaxing. One of my favorite things to do is sit in front of YouTube listening to stories and make candle holders or wind chimes with my glue gun and those interesting pieces of nature that you can find in the forest near my house. One of the best crafts I ever made is this beautiful fairy lantern which is a decorated mason jar with a silhouette of a fairy on it and an electric tea light inside. It doesn't sound too impressive but trust me it looks amazing. Anyway, this happened last year, right after Halloween, actually. I was out in the forest collecting pine cones, acorns, and berries for my next project, and it was late afternoon. I didn't want to go too far inside, because at this time of the year, the sun goes down early, around 4.30 or so, and I didn't want to be in the forest after dark. That day was unseasonably warm. And for some reason, I was having a much easier time than usual finding usable materials. It was like everywhere I looked, there was a perfect seed pod or an acorn with a vibrant green bottom and a top without any chips or dings in it. It was cool. I found myself being led deeper and deeper into the forest though, because I kept spotting more and more things that I wanted to add to my collection. Eventually, I noticed that it was starting to get dark, and I knew that if I didn't head back soon, I would still be in the forest after nightfall. At the same time, I noticed something glittering up ahead on the trail, and I decided to take a second to quickly see what it was. And though I couldn't figure it out, I could see that it was glittering. And I did find a beautiful snail shell sitting on this leaf. I was about to pick it up, and see if it still had a snail inside when something hit me on the head. It didn't hurt, but I definitely felt something small hit me. I looked up and saw a crow sitting on a branch above my head staring at me. I ran my fingers through my hair and found a small twig and just assumed that the crow had knocked the twig loose and that's what hit me. Then when I went to look for the snail shell again, it was gone. This was very strange to me because I only looked away for a few seconds. And even if there was a snail in that shell, snails don't move that fast. Unless, of course, it's the racing snail from the never-ending story. This confused me, so I started looking around, searching for that shell. 
assuming that maybe it just slipped under the leaf or something. The shell turned out to be right next to a bush with these small bright red berries on it. And I started to look more closely at this bush. Something suddenly burst out of the bush across the path and then disappeared into the bushes on the other side. Now, my first instinct was that it was a rabbit, but on second look, it didn't look like a rabbit at all. It actually looked like this tiny little person. It was on two legs, not four like an animal, and it seemed to be wearing rustic clothing. I distinctly remember brown overalls and a greenish brown shirt. Its skin was this olive tone and it had messy brown hair. This is what I remember from the split second I looked at it. Maybe this being imparted its vision on me so it knew what I was looking at. Why else would it make itself known? It moved as fast as a rabbit, maybe even faster. I'm sure it wasn't a rabbit. It seemed wild, but there was something cute about it too, like it was a kid, but much smaller than a kid maybe even smaller than a bunny. Now, I didn't feel threatened or like it had an evil energy to it, but I still felt freaked out enough that I had to get out of there right away. I ran all the way back down the path and only stopped when I was out of the forest. And it was a good thing too, because it was pretty much dark by the time I got back to my car. Thinking back on it, I think I might have stumbled upon a fairy child playing in those bushes and maybe that snail shell belonged to him. I know it sounds crazy, but I really do feel like I encountered a fey being. And I feel like it's a him, not a her. I think maybe that crow was trying to distract me so that fairy child could get a snail shell and slip away. But then I looked back too quickly. At least that's how I imagine the situation because he didn't feel negative in any way. He actually felt kind of playful. It was just like the feeling that these two worlds were colliding that weren't meant to. I haven't seen it since, but I get the feeling that they're out there with me when I go out there to look for more supplies for my arts and crafts. I've been back to that same spot in the forest a few times, but again, haven't experienced anything like I did on that day. It was just a truly strange and magical experience that I'll never forget. I know there's a lot of people that are skeptical about this kind of thing and might think that what I saw was a trick of the light, but I have 20-20 vision and it wasn't that far away from me. This wasn't an animal and it definitely wasn't a trick of the light. I saw a fairy that day and I truly believe there are more in this world and there are things that we just don't understand yet. This all started when I decided to go out for a night drive up to my new favorite spot that was local to me. I was driving up the mountain, just taking it easy and enjoying the view. And when I reached the top, I parked in this designated viewing area and took some videos and pictures of my car and the surrounding woods. While doing this though, I started getting that feeling like I was being watched from the surrounding wilderness. I wasn't surprised though, and kind of expected this. It was the middle of the night, and there were more than likely some predators out there trying to see what the ruckus was all about. But then it got very intense suddenly, like ominously intense. So I started to wrap it up and just started moving locations to get a nice view of the stars and just enjoy the scenery. But then I had that overwhelming sense of fear wash over me out of nowhere again. So I grabbed my speaker that was playing music but under 25% volume so I wouldn't disturb the wildlife. I hopped in my car, rolled up the hand crank for both windows, reattached my steering wheel, put it into reverse, stalled it, and then took off. If you know anything about cars, you know, Miatas are great in the canyons because how light and nimble they are, although they're underpowered. I also pride myself in being a good driver and knowing my car and my limits, so keep this in mind when you listen to my story. When I was driving, I lost that urgent sense of fear, so I slowed down to reach a store at the top and I parked just to get my bearings. 
I felt that soft feeling of being watched again, but it wasn't too bad this time around, so I just started editing the photo and video. Then again, I got hit with that overwhelming urge to run as much as I can. So I started driving again, and I have this overwhelming sense of dread, fear, and urgency just watching over me the whole time. At this point, I'm hauling ass at the top of third gear. I again lose that overwhelming sense, and it just lingers at this point. So I back off the throttle and put it into fifth gear and proceed to try and calm down. But unsurprisingly, it hits me again full force. So I drop a gear and attempt to disappear. I'm double laning, taking the apex, understeering and oversteering. But the feeling keeps getting more intense as time goes on. And on this one straightaway, it feels like something is about to reach out and grab me from behind. At the next corner, I hit the brakes and turn. And I swear, I saw the reflection of two eyes in my mirror and some long, tall thing less than two car lengths behind me. At seeing this thing, I hit the throttle, kicking the back of my car out and almost losing control, but I was able to reel it back in. At this point, I'm driving with little to no self-preservation. I'm getting so close to the inside of each turn, I slide because of the dirt, and I'm kicking clouds up behind me. Whatever that thing was chasing me, I lost it on this long, sweeping turn where I hit my top speed. But following that is a series of low speed corners where it catches right back up to me and I feel this sense of loss almost overpower me. But I just push the gas in more and keep on trying to outrun it. On the way down, I pass some sort of Mercedes SUV going up the hill on a straightaway. I see the headlights suddenly disappear right before the next corner and all of these feelings suddenly become non-existent. But I was afraid they were going to come back, so I kept pushing hard. About 30 seconds later, they all came back full tilt, and I just kept on going. About a minute later, I see the thing in my mirror again. I keep driving hard, gaining and losing ground for the next 5 minutes or so. Then I pass some sort of pickup truck, and as before, I lost those feelings again. I made it right at the stop sign and got through all the gears again, but that intense feeling came back when I hit 4th. I passed a gas station when I was driving, but I didn't stop because I felt this thing was so close. But then I entered the lights that came onto the streets and everything felt like it would be okay. But again, less than a second later, when I left those lights, those feelings hit me again. Although I was going so fast, I believe I was outrunning it at this point. There was one spot in my mind that I was running towards because there was a lot of people in that area, so I figured that would be the safest. As I drove faster and got further, those feelings were much less intense. And as I approached civilization, I pulled over in the spot I decided was my safe zone. So there I stopped and shut off the car to let it cool off. And all I smell was the brakes and tires from running it so hard. I hit up a few of my buddies who were local to the area. And they said they're not surprised that I saw something up there that might have been like a skinwalker or some shit. Because there's Native American tribes less than 10 miles away from that spot. I'm mildly superstitious, so I know some native folklore, but stuff like this, I don't believe. I don't think there's skinwalkers in this area. From what I know though, Wendigos might be mainly exclusive to the east coast. But from a quick Google image search, I looked and the thing that I saw most resembled a Wendigo. It was a biped, but it could switch to four legs. It was pure white with orange and red eyes and could run upwards of 60 miles an hour. What kind of creature can do that? I did a quick search earlier and haven't found anything of the sorts being reported. But then again, I'm not very knowledgeable in this area. This was the most terrified I've ever been in my entire life, hands down. I don't have any history of mental illness. This wasn't a hallucination and it wasn't my imagination. I didn't let fear get the best of me because I was freaked out because I was in the forest. I go up there all the time. Something was chasing me. The area is Southern California, near Escondido. The mountain is practically surrounded by Native American tribes. I was at the top, near 12.30 a.m. I wrote this down mainly to document what happened to me, in case it happens to someone else, here or wherever. But if you can help identify this thing, I'd appreciate it. I went to see a local medicine man, or shaman, to see if it tagged me and to have myself cleansed. They said I wasn't tagged by this thing, but cleansed me anyway. 
I've been up there every weekend since then and haven't felt anything again, but I always have friends with me every time now. I'm never going up there solo alone again. That's for damn sure. For those saying it's fake, or that any encounter is fake because you think these creatures don't exist, I assure you, this and so many other encounters are 100% real. It's extremely scary, and it's a horrible thing that happened to me. Just writing it out will give you the same feelings that I experienced, and I will never be able to truly describe how I felt or what that thing was properly. I know this email is written like a story, but I promise you that all the events are true, told how I experienced them. So just for some quick context, when I was 17 years old, I got sent to a boarding school where I met a lot of different people. While the story is too strange to explain, I ended up moving from Washington State to Hyannis Port in Cape Cod with three other friends that I'd met while in school. We were living with one of my friends, his name's John, and we were in his dad's vacation house. It was a decently sized house, probably old, tucked into the trees on a private road with a small lake at the end of the backyard and a cranberry bog sprawled across the front street of the house. All right, now that you have a premise, let's get into what I actually experienced. The first strange thing that happened occurred a week or two after our arrival. I was walking back from the lake, having just enjoyed a sunset from the peaceful comfort of a little dock that was perched on the edge of our yard. It was starting to get a little dark. Nothing crazy, but that early shade of early evening. The house was about 30 feet away or so from where I was. But suddenly, I began to feel the strangest sensation. It felt as though things or people or something were creeping out of the surrounding trees and approaching me. And then it felt as if all of them lined up behind me and followed me to the house. I was slightly unsettled to say the least, and I brought the topic up to John that night while we were smoking on the deck. Man, this backyard is a trip. I got the weirdest feeling earlier, like I... But John cut me off. Like people were coming from all sides and then following you? Yeah, that's really creepy. John had literally taken the words out of my mouth. To this day, I'll never forget that unsettling feeling that he already knew what was going on. After being there for about a month, we finally all started making some friends. We'd started attending Cape Cod Community College, and we were excited to meet people. One evening, John and I set out to our friend's house, who'd invited us over for a kickback or bonfire sort of deal. It was rude of us, but we'd started to sort of ignore our other two roommates, leaving them to just kind of do their own thing. But anyways, we turned down a small street on the way to our new friend's house. Google Maps states our destination was just up ahead. As we were pulling up to park on the other side of the road, my friend and I noticed two people, seemingly wearing fat suits underneath their suits, strolling casually down the road as if they were totally normal. John burst out laughing and hurried to park. We jumped out to scan the trees, but there was nothing there. What the hell? I wanted to get a Snapchat, John said. We had a good laugh, and then we ran to the end of the street and looked both ways, but literally nothing was there. We were both confused, and we confirmed with each other that we actually saw the two people walking around like they were in fat suits. Since they just vanished, we shrugged and went back to the kickback. I'm still not entirely sure what all that was about, but this truly last strange event that I experienced has changed the way that I look at the world. I had just driven with John to the gas station to pick up some cigarettes. It was around 11 p.m. and late in the month of October, so the Cape was starting to get that little chilly feeling, to say the least. We pulled up to the house and noticed that the garage was still open. It wasn't uncommon. Our other two roommates never closed it. Again, I just shrugged and went inside. John entered the house too, and we began walking to the back hallway, leading to the sunroom in the garage. There's a garage switch conveniently placed right at the beginning of the hall. We approached the hallway together, and John walked over to the button. Suddenly, he looks back at me with this look of terror that I'll never forget, and I knew exactly what he was thinking. The hallway was freezing. 
Mind you, we were both wearing our coats, which kept us warm outside. This was different. This cold went all the way through you. I watched as all the blood drained from John's face, and he began pushing the garage button. But for some reason, the door just kept jamming. I practically jumped backwards, stepping quickly away from the door with that strange feeling. The garage door finally worked, and John hurried into the kitchen. Our other roommates were in the living room watching TV and asked us what was wrong because they saw the looks on our faces. John was still pale and looked completely shaken, and suddenly he just collapsed. Not like a smack, but you know, like he felt lightheaded, decided to sit, and ended up fainting. My roommates ran over, and we helped him up. He opened his eyes, grabbed the kitchen trash can, and vomited. That was so weird, he said to me. Well, those were the strangest occurrences. Cape Cod had a few other quirks. Driving around at night, I saw more people walking than in any other place I'd ever lived. This wasn't a big area either. For example, if we were visiting our friends in Dennisport, about 25-ish minutes from where we lived, we'd just left and we were driving down a semi-narrow road when suddenly a dark figure appeared just in front of us and on the shoulder of the road. John literally swerved onto the other side of the road to avoid clipping this guy with his side view mirror. I looked back and the man just kept walking. I've seen many late night walkers on the Cape, always wearing dark colors, just strolling through the night. And none of these people seem to even realize what's going on. They act like nobody else is even there, which brings me to a question. Are they even really there? Or are we seeing spirits from some other part of time. John and I were walking at night and we both came to a spot in the road that just felt weird. There was nothing out of the ordinary, but we both just glanced at each other and confirmed we were feeling the same thing. Like this heavy chill or this ominous feeling of worry just draping over us. We'd walk a little further and seem to get right out of it and feel better again. I'm not saying this is anything too crazy, could have been some weird pressure thing, but due to our experiences in the Cape, it seemed a little weird. The house we lived in, or at least the area, was supposedly home to a ghost resembling the Quaker Oats guy. John's mom had seen him in her bathroom once, and the neighbors claimed he was casually walking through their living room. I never saw this lost guy that looked like a pilgrim, but I'm not in disbelief because I've seen other creatures too, or other entities at least. If you'd ever been to the Cape, you'll know that it just feels very old, and there's areas here that just seem weird. I'd imagine all the smaller parts of the towns in New England have that feeling too. It's just a really old place, or maybe it's one of those places where the veil is thinner and you can get feelings that you couldn't in other places. We only lived there for a couple of months due to a certain circumstances, and then ended up road tripping to California with our two friends that had flown up to meet us. However, my time there was long enough to give me appreciation for history and paranormal phenomenon. It brought up a lot of questions that I might never get the answers to.